My name is John Hamry, and uh, the president here at CSS, and I'm delighted that we're having the, this opportunity. Um, and the only, uh, my only disappointment is there ought to be a thousand people in this room to listen to this program. You know, this is so important. Uh, you know, for the last, you know, 15 years, we've spent 10 times as much focusing on nuclear weapons than we have on human rights abuses in Korea. And it's overdue that we deal with it. I really do congratulate the UN government for putting a spotlight on this. It's, um, you know, when we had years of engagement with North Korea, we just set aside this whole topic of human rights. This is the biggest gulag left in the world. Although we've got a couple of countries that are coming up behind them. But it is still a tragedy, and it's not really adequately understood and known. And so I'm really very pleased that we have this opportunity for this conference. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Victor Cha. He's had a consistent interest and focus on human rights abuses in Korea and in North Korea. And uh, I know that he's been had a chance to work with Ambassador Lee, and we're looking forward to your keynote speech. And, I want to just say congratulations to you, Ambassador. It's, it's a, such an important agenda and profile, and we're so pleased that you're taking the lead on that. Thank you. Um, we are going to hear from, um, from Foreign Minister Park Jin. He will be with us recorded, um, uh, because you know, he's, it's hard for him to travel when he's needed everywhere. But he did grace us with this pre-recorded session. We're very, very pleased to have Ambassador Cho with us. Now, he's, as I told him earlier, I said there's one, only one benefit for getting older. And that is you get to see these fabulous young talents rise up to success and towering heights. And I've had the opportunity with Ambassador Cho for many years to see him rising higher and higher and higher in the foreign ministry and then in the rather abrupt and sudden change that occurred, you know, in uh, about a month ago, you know, it was, it, it just was seamless. And I learned from Victor this morning that Agra Ma took six days, okay, that's never happened. Uh, so it just shows how important Korea is to us now at this very vital time, This crucial time and uh, and Korea sent its very best and so could I ask all of you with your very enthusiastic applause welcome to the stage the ambassador from the Republic of Korea uh, Hun Dong Cho please well Good morning, everyone. Well, Dr. Hamney, John, thank you so much for your kind words. I remember the uh, first time I met you, I was uh, first secretary at the embassy. I think it was 20, 23 years ago, something like that. So you've been um, watching me growing and rising. <laughs> you, you were the witness. Uh, Ambassador Yi Xinhua, uh, Ambassador Yi jong -hun, and Dr. Victor Cha and distinguished guests, welcome to CSIS conference on North Korean human rights and, and international cooperation. I'm honored to join you today for such a timely and meaningful event. You know, actually, I arrived in Washington last Friday and presented my credentials to the President Biden face to face uh, just two days ago. So I already feel a tremendous amount of responsibility in my new duties as this is a time when our alliance is reaching a new height in an increasingly complex global environment. It could not be more fitting that one of my very first official act as the Korean ambassador to the United States is to join you to discuss this critical issue of North Korean human rights. This morning, uh, we will discuss our path forward to ensure that all North Koreans are able to live as dignified human beings, as so evidently stipulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we know, of course, this goal is far from being reached. 
the widespread, systematic, and gross violation of human rights in North Korea, as documented by the UNCOI report in 2014, continue to this day. It would be naive to expect a magical breakthrough, but a gathering like this gives us a real meaning to our concerted effort to bring everyone together under the banner of human rights. In this regard, I'd like to thank again Dr. Hamney and his CSIS colleagues for organizing this conference today. I also wanted to recognize Justice Kirby and the other commissioners and staff members of UNCOI for their groundbreaking work on North Korean human rights issues. President Yoon Sung Nil has emphasized the full disclosure of reality of a human rights violation by the Pyongyang regime is a matter of national security. Given the guidance, my government has delivered a constant flow of new and bold measures on North Korean human rights issues. Our first step was the appointment of Ambassador Yi Xinhua as Ambassador for International Cooperation on North Korean Human Rights. Until Ambassador Li was appointed last July, the post had been vacant for five years since Ambassador Yi Jong hoon completed his term in 2017. So I'm so pleased that both Ambassador Yi Xinhua and Yi Jong hoon are here with us today, and so good to see you again. What is more, uh, my government co-sponsored United Nations General Assembly and United Nations Human Rights Council resolutions on North Korean human rights for the first time in four and five years, respectively. And on March 30th, the Korean Ministry of Unification published its very first official government-level report on North Korean human rights. This report documents first-hand account of more than 500 defectors and vividly portrays how Pyongyang's oppression routinely violates even the most basic human rights. The report makes it clear that the DPLK regime is denying civil and political rights through torture and human, inhumane treatment, arbitrary arrest, and disregard for the right to privacy and free movement. They are denying economic, social, and cultural rights by depriving their people of proper health care, access to food and education. Rather than protecting the most vulnerable, women, children, and people with disabilities are often being targeted by the regime specifically because of those vulnerabilities. The report also places a firm emphasis on POW, abductees, and divided families, all of whom are in desperate need of our help before it's too late. Moving forward under President Yoon's leadership, my government will continue to promote universal values of freedom anywhere, everywhere, including north of the DMG. If we are to hold Pyongyang regime responsible and accountable for its actions, bring about substantive changes to its human rights practice, and achieve our shared goal of complete denuclearization of DPLK, it is imperative that we work together with the international community. So in doing so, our greatest asset around the world are our partnership with those who share our values. The ironclad ROK-US alliance, which is celebrating its 70th anniversary this year, is particularly important. So with the state budget of the president even just around the corner, I'm sure that our two president discussion will afford significant attention to the critical issue of North Korean human rights. I'd like to just briefly share my personal story. Both of my parents grew up in Hwangye province, North Korea, and they defected during the Korean War. Like so many of their generation, they never got to see the family they left behind. So I grew up knowing I had a family on the other side of DMG. And to this day, I don't know what happened to them and uh, if they are alive or if they have any children. But though I've never met them or know how many cousins I have, I inherited from my parents the incessant longing to be reunited one day. So I can assure you throughout my tenure as Korean ambassador to the United States, addressing grave human rights concern 
in North Korea will be among my highest priorities. So I look forward to working uh, with all of you in the future to help affect a positive change in North Korea. Thank you very much. Dr. John Hamri, Ambassador Cho Hyun Dong, Ambassador Lee Shin Hua, Deputy Assistant Secretary Jung Park, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to address you at this meaningful event. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the UN Commission of Inquiry on the North Korean human rights situation. Regrettably, even after a decade, there are no signs of improvement. The North Korean people are still suffering from systematic, widespread, and gross human rights violations. On top of that, amidst the prolonged COVID-19 border closures, natural disasters, and food shortages, the humanitarian situation in North Korea is deteriorating further. Recently, there have been alarming reports that starvation is rampant and that people are even dying of hunger in many parts of North Korea. The North Korean people are not only suffering from shortages of food. I believe we would all agree that human beings cannot live on food for the body alone. Every one of us has the right to freedom of thought, the food that nurtures minds, and makes one grow into something yet bigger than oneself. Lamentably, the North Korean people are far from enjoying this fundamental freedom. On the contrary, the North Korean regime is tightening the ideological grip on its people. In recent years, it has adopted a series of laws such as Reactionary Ideology and Culture Rejection Act, and Pyongyang Cultural Language Protection Act. These laws strictly forbid contact with and proliferation of outside information. Moreover, the Kim regime is venturing onto an ever more dangerous path of WMD development, threatening the peace and security of the region and beyond. Needless to say, this puts its own people and others at real risk. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The declaration says that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The sad reality is that this fundamental maxim does not apply at all in North Korea. In a spirit of fraternity, we should never allow ourselves to forget the suffering of the North Korean people. For only by remembering and recounting the dire human rights situation on the ground can we bring about change. As part of our efforts to enable the world to be better informed about the grave human rights situation in North Korea, my government has recently published the 2023 North Korean Human Rights Report. It is the first publicly available report by the Korean government based on the testimonies of more than 500 North Korean defectors. The report brings to light the egregious human rights abuses and violations in North Korea. I would like to ask for your close attention to this report. To conclude, the international community as a whole should work together to ease the anguish of ordinary North Korean people. And I'm reassured today by the presence of all of you that we are all in this together. Thank you, and I wish you all a productive and inspiring discussion.
Well, thank you um, to the Foreign Minister for those remarks. Um, welcome everybody to CSIS. My name is Victor Cha, Senior Vice President for Asia and Korea Chair here at CSIS. And uh, I too want to echo my uh, welcome to Ambassador, good friend Ambassador Cho for joining us. His, I think probably your first public uh, event uh, since arriving, so we are honored uh, uh, for that. Uh, and uh, of course, Ambassador Lee Jung-hun, the, the first ambassador for uh, international cooperation on human rights. We're very glad to have you back at CSIS as well. Um, so uh, we'll now move to our opening remarks by uh, Ambassador Lee. Um, ambassador Lee shin is the ambassador at large for international cooperation on North Korean human rights. Um, in addition to this, she also is currently a professor who is actually still teaching uh, at uh, Korea University despite her very hectic uh, schedule um, and uh, is a very accomplished author, has written uh, many wonderful books and articles on issues, on a range of issues related to human rights as well as UN peacekeeping. Um, so an accomplished scholar and now uh, and a, a, and a, a very important diplomat on a very important issue. So ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Lee Xinhua for our opening remarks. Thank you, Victor, Professor Victor Cha. <laughs> Thank you for the President Hamley to having me here, and uh, Ambassador Jo, despite your very busy schedule, thank you so much to join us, and Ambassador Lee Jong Un, who has been always supportive of me, thank you very much, and then Ambassador Park In Guk, uh, who just came here for only one day, but still come here to cheer me as he always do and ladies and gentlemen. In interest of time, I prepare uh, my speech, so let me just quickly read what I should offer you. Uh, what I say today overlaps somewhat with uh, several recent speeches I've given, including yesterday's talk at Brookings. Uh, so I have to work on this morning to write some other the points, but still there are things that it might be overlapped. Well, not only because my brain capacity is limited, but also because the, I think this point could be the matter of life and death for North Korean people and be clear warning for North Korean regime. So I think we need to be emphasize those points over and over again. There are still some places in the world where human rights are violated by dictators and authoritarian leaders and North Korea is one of the worst. With the exception of the Kim family and a few el elites, the majority of country's citizens are denied civil, political, food, economic, social, information, and freedom of movement right. The first, within North Korea, food, health, and information rights of ordinary people are almost at their worst level. While the Kim family and a small elite enjoy the expensive luxury goods and all the entertainment, pop culture, and entertainment of the capitalist West that they decry as so decadent and evil. Violation of basic rights in terms of universal values in favor of regime security, according to the Freedom House Index, North Korea is ranked only as a, the 0.3 out of the total of the 100 point. Direct link between North Korea's military provocation and human rights issues uh, the problems as well. Right to food is obviously important, but North Korean people doesn't have it much. North Korea needs about a total of 5.8 million tons of food supply annually. About 80 to 85 million tons of food shortages every year as well. Report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in North Korea, 41.6% of North Korean population is malnourished in the year 2019 to 2021. Meanwhile, North Korea fired some 100 missiles within less than two years, including 71 last year alone, which can buy 
1 million ton of rice, enough to cover annual food shortages, even with some surpluses, according to the Korean Minister of Unification. COVID-19 has become a great excuse and rationale for Kim Jong-un's tight control of the population and the vicious punishment and isolation from the outside world, as well as for increased capability for military provocations using external enemies as a pretext of their aggression. The consequences are more severe economic hardship, food shortages, and violation of civil and liberty rights of North Korea's ordinary people, particularly vulnerable groups. The second right to information. What I call three evil laws to counter external influence, as the foreign minister just mentioned as well, those three laws are like a terrible human rights violations crack down people's right to know. The regime blocks the flow of information through strict law and harsh punishment, including the death penalty for simply watching and distributing so-called illegal content such as South Korean drama and movie and music, and for the use of South Korean uh, style language under the name of protecting DPRK's culture and identity. But North Korea's those three control appears not to be that effective for the new generation. North Korean news question and complain about what's wrong with movies and words. They are not like their parents. Even though they have been hardened by crackdowns and controls, and they've been long brainwashed about those things, their reaction to censorship is, I just need to be more careful. If I don't talk about South Korean movie with my friends, if I don't use a South Korean style language, I don't have much things to do with my friends. That is the, those MZ generation's idea and thought, even in North Korea. The tight control imposed by these laws is clear evidence that capitalist culture is already deeply rooted in North Korean society. It shows that the regime considers information flow to be the most serious security threat. Second, North Korean defectors and overseas workers in China and elsewhere. In August 2022, open letter from North Korean human rights organizations have been, have, was sent to the former Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. They concern about the safety and human rights of 1,170 North Korean refugees at that time and preventing their forced repatriation. UN report over 2,000 North Korean defectors are there. We don't know exactly how many are there, but one thing clear is those ref refugees are at risk of being forcibly repatriated by Chinese government to North Korea who are subjects to severe punishment, including execution. UN sanction resolution 2397, announced in December 2017. According to that resolution and sanction, UN member states are required to repatriate all North Korean workers sent to their countries by December 2019. In 2021, a significant number of North Korean workers continue to work, work. They are not informed about the labor laws of their host countries and are unaware of their rigorous rights. Wage extortion, about 70 to 90% of wages have to go to the, their government and overwork. And all those things are equivalent to, I would say, modern day slavery. In addition to human rights abuses experienced by North Korean people within North Korea, we have to also remember overseas, well, I'm, I'm sorry, the, we have to also remember those crimes against humanity conducted by North Korean regime against foreign nationals, including South Korean, such as the detainment of South Korean prisoners of war and abductees during and after war time. According to the 2014 UNCY report, up to 70,000 South Koreans were captured during the Korean War. That could be as many as 90,000 according to the South Korean government's estimate. And more than 500 were detained by the North at that time. As of July 2021, 
an estimated 170 are alive in North Korea, and six South Korean citizens are currently detained, not knowing if they are alive or dead. I met families of South Korean POWs, abductees, and detainees sometimes, in, uh, including public meeting with them last February, along with U.S. Deputy Representative for North Korean Policy, Dr. Chung Park, who's going to join us today as well. We must not overlook heartbreaking situation of these individuals and their family members. And then we have to further strengthen international cooperation to these tragic issues. Then why is the North Korean human right is important? Number one, universal value of humanity as a basic human right issues. As uh, Ambassador Choi Hyun-dong has mentioned, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of UN Declaration of Human Rights this year. This is the prime time for us to address those North Korean human rights issue is an international issue, and North Korean human rights issue is a key issue among the serious global human rights issue facing the global community. So we do have a duty of a global citizens to protect them. Number two, in December 2014, UN Ambassador Oh Jun then at that time told the UN Security Council that North Koreans are not just anybody's to South Koreans. North Korean regime's crime against humanity continue to North Korea, our people. North Koreans are not anybody's. Third, separate families, abductees, prisoners of war, and illegal detention are human rights issues for South Koreans. Contact between family members and meetings without no obstruction and the right to return home are not gift from North Korea in exchange for improved inter-Korean relations or South Korea's concessions to North Korea's regime. But international legal obligations that must be met with accountability if North Korea did not reply to the South Korea's request for the reunion of separate families. As Ambassador Cho has mentioned as well, if not observed, especially for those who are getting older, they don't have much time left to see their separated but beloved family members. Fourth, North Korean human rights issues are now at the most influential agenda in the context of North Korea question, including nuclear and missile provocations, economic difficulties, food shortages, information blockade, diplomatic isolation, and even North Korea country con contingencies. Human rights are obviously the Achilles heel of the North Korean regime in the inter-Korean regional and international relations. This is an area of asymmetrical influence and leverage in the relationship with North Korea based on principles and rationale and universal value of freedom, democracy, and human rights. Still, we should remember human rights issue is not a means but an end state. So we have to build up careful and strat careful strategic uh, ideas together how we can make a human rights issue as an end state while we are working very hard uh, to use those the human rights issue to persuade the North Korea to change their courses. Fifth, the North Korean human rights issue is a crime against humanity committed by the North Korean regime, which does not abide by international norms and it's upset, they are upset, only obsessed with regime security through dictatorship, um, population border control, and military adventurism. Promoting human rights in North Korea is a key part of South Korea's goal of liberal democratic reunifications. Still, it's very hard for us to access to human rights issues in unified voices because of the politicization of the human rights issues and difficult to agree on terminology and approach. Uh, difficult to institutionalizing and making a legal action because we don't have any international and domestic consensus over what we mean by North Korean human rights is. And the third is lost in priority because only Korean NGO and few international organization uh, appears to be interested in this while we South North Korean uh, human rights issues sidelined uh, all the time, I mean, uh, usually because of other headline news such as the Ukraine and the Sudan crisis. And also the decades long, we working hard for North Korean human rights issues, although we have a difficult time in between. 
but how to expand and strengthen international public discourse and overcome the fatigue phenomena and take out North Korean issue from the ghetto is uh, our big challenges. For that, I hope this 75th anniversary of Human Rights Declaration year, as well as the, the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the COI, I hope this will be the good momentum for us to revitalize North Korean human rights issues. For that, I think the media role is very important. While covering North Korea, I, when it comes to covering North Korea, global media for, uh, tend to focus on military issues, Kim Jong-un's personal life, including what his daughter Kim Jue wear, like a luxurious coat, and what Kim Jong-un uh, wear uh, for his watch, and etc., which are interest to their readers and will generate high readership. Perhaps our discussion today will not be of much interest outside of the Korean media. I think that's a pity. So hopefully the, our domestic Korean and the, the global media should play the bigger role for us. Then what is the role of the Yoon Sang-yeol governments in terms of the direction of the human rights in North Korea? South Korea's strategic concern as a country caught in the middle of the US-China powers are great, and economic security and military deterrence to North Korea provocation is critical. However, the Yoon sang government is fully aware of there is a need for an international consensus on what should be emphasized, even if it means long, losing some short-term national interest for world peace or humanity. One of the entry points should be the North Korean human rights issue. It is the government's position that human rights should never be compromised by any means and under any political circumstances. The release of the first ever governmental official North Korean human rights report, as foreign minister has mentioned as well, is also a strong expression of President Yoon's commitment to human rights. Last but not least, let me just talk about the suggestion for improving human rights situation in North Korea briefly. The first, accountability for the North Korean regime, documentation, preservation, and possible future punishment of the human rights abusers in North Korea for preventive effect are important. Number two, North Korea's military threat and human rights abuses are two sides of the one coin. The missile cost, food, suspected radioactive exposure near Pungeri nuclear test sites, and all those things are closely uh, show, us, uh, show us how closely those military provocation and human rights issues are related. Despite decade-long efforts to denuclearization, as our President Hemney has also mentioned, uh, I don't think we didn't go anywhere, but we only make North Korea more emboldened and spoiled and to become even stronger nuclear state. That's why we have to mainstream human rights issues, no matter what kind of foreign policy we are taking place when it comes to North Korea. Third, to improve North Korea's human rights situation, we must prioritize accountability, but also deliberately consider how to better implement so-called constructive engagement. Constructing, by constructive engagement, uh, including uh, humanitarian aid, I wouldn't imply that we should revert back to the definition provided by the previous progressive government who focused on humanitarian aid while neglecting human rights issues. Rather, I mean that we need to come up with a better way to provide humanitarian aid and draft a more effective overall strategy to fundamentally improve the lives and human rights of North Korean citizens. Since North Korean's human rights violation fundamentally involved the North Korean regime, we must create a checklist on how the international community can approach the issue with a unified voice and not only pressure the North Korean regime alone, but to engage constructively to figure out how to resolve the fundamental protection of human rights violation taking place in North Korea. Fourth, instead of the just feeling sorry for North Korean people and defectors, we should recognize that a new generation is growing up and they can offer new ideas and creative energy to tackle long-standing issues like human rights issues in North Korea. These young people have the power and capacity to use their voices, innovation, and activism to raise awareness, push for changes in North Korea, and help shape policy that promote human rights and democracy and freedom and lead to positive change in North Korea. Given these points, there is a great expectation for young North Korean defectors and others to play a significant role. 
Indeed, constructive engagement, international humanitarian assistance as a key tool to improve human rights and the daily lives of the North Korean peoples. For that, transparency and effectiveness of international uh, community through unitary voice and uh, collective action, collective and sustainable action are key. The fifth, overcome chronic international fatigue on the North Korean human rights issue by refocusing the issue and renewing international attention and solidarity. We should persuade and engage not only like-minded countries, but also those with different ideas. Six, depoliticization within South Korean society, not in terms of liberal versus conservative parties, which we should speak up the voice of the Republic of Korea who value liberal democracy. Second, and seventh, engaging in human rights dialogue with the Chinese government by utilizing China's obligation not to forcefully repatriate North Korean defectors, uh, based on the treaty obligation Article 33.1-1 of the Refugee Convention and Article 3 of the Convention Against the Torture and the UN Charter and Human Rights Protection Mechanism of the United Nations. Whether international pressure, naming or shaming, or quiet diplomacy required uh, delicate balancing with cautious strategic consultations with allies when it comes to when we deal with the North, the China. China. Ace, is the speak up campaign, I say. Various campaigns, conferences, and articles to promote human rights in North Korea. And the, some American NGOs say human rights upfront approach. Raising awareness and encouraging activists among young people, what I call youth outreach project, is very important to promote public, private, academic cooperation at home and abroad and expanding exchange between Korean NGOs and international community, including Korean diplomatic uh, missions. Last but not least, I would like to conclude the, my remark saying, instead of just feeling sorry for North Korean people and defector and taking them as an only victim, we should recognize that a new generation is growing up and they can offer, once again, new ideas and full energy to tackle long-standing issue like freedom, democracy, human rights of North Korea. These young people have the power to use their voice, and these peoples can have our future designed differently. So while we give them more empowerment, we, the international community, should let them know, let North Korean know, we are here to help them to improve their basic right to food, right to know, and freedom to choose. But at the very same time, I would like to let them know they have a capacity to change. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Lee, for those wonderful comments. I, um, I may, I'm amazed you wrote those at 4 a.m. this morning. <laughs> But uh, really important points and very operational as well in terms of things that we should be thinking about and doing. Um, I think uh, what we'll do now um, is we'll move directly into our uh, first panel. And I'd like to Im invite Ambassador Lee to, to the stage. Um, and our other th three uh, participants, Ambassador King, uh, Justice Kirby and Special Rapporteur Salmon are online, are joining us online. So, uh, Ambassador are they on, are they online now? Okay. Okay. So I will turn it over to Ambassador, uh, Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you very much. Well, uh, since I didn't get a chance to take a Q&A, uh, while we're having a proceeding uh, the session, I will also be happy to take uh, some uh, questions. Uh, this session is uh, kind of the featuring <coughs> to celebrating the 10th anniversary of the establishment of a Commission of Inquiry on North Korean the human rights 
as you know, uh, the, the COI was established in 2013 by help of uh, different uh, international NGOs who's been dedicated to North Korean human rights issues, uh, as well as the, the UN uh, the mechanisms, and also those people whom I was able to invite today. So I think this will be the wonderful opportunity for us to um, the, listen to their voices, what they've been doing uh, in order to make this COI happen. And then thanks to those establishment of COI, what kind of change we had made so far. Uh, and then what we still have are challenges and the limitations uh, that will naturally lead to the, the, the future task for us. The, for that, although at that time, uh, the, our special, UN Special Rapporteur Elizabeth Salmon, who is a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, was not able, uh, didn't participate in, uh, in that process 10 years ago. The, I'm sure the, uh, the she has uh, lots of the tasks based on the, this achievements and limitation of the COI. So having said that, uh, I would like to start with uh, Ambassador Jung Hoon Lee, who is the, my predecessor and good senior colleague of mine, uh, who played uh, this great role uh, about, uh, in, do, even during the difficult times. So let me just briefly just uh, give you on floor and on, uh, as a first round, the, what you observed for the establishment of COI and what was the significance of the establishment of the COI? Well, um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, Ambassador Ishina. I'd like to thank Victor uh, for inviting me uh, to this very important, timely uh, conference just preceding, of course, the summit meeting that's supposed to take place uh, next week. Um, coming back here is uh, really special because it brings back fond memories. Um, I think you remember, Victor, in February 2015, we had the first, we co-organized the first anniversary of the COI uh, report. And I woke up really early in the morning, and um, I think Bob and um, Michael would, um, would remember that day, it actually snowed uh, in Washington, D.C. And it doesn't snow that much in Washington. So I looked out, very worried that, um, because you know, as the day went on, it, it, we heard that the schools were being closed down, the governments were being closed down, and we were really afraid that you know, it would be a really low turnout uh, on the day. So you know, I was really holding my um, breath. But because, um, you know, and then I looked out and it's not like we have a foot of snow, it's just like one inch, but it doesn't snow that much in Washington. So the, you know, the city response to that kind of snow was uh, <laughs> not, not very efficient. But, um, you know, it turned out to be a great, um, great conference and we had the second one the following year um, and so on. So, my, my thinking is that, I mean, I'm sure that Michael um, can go into the, you know, the, the details of the COI because he's the architect. Um, but I would just say that the 10 years since the advent of the Commission of Inquiry, and then of course this conference's title is the COI plus 10. So what do we do for the next 10 years? And I had the good fortune of becoming ambassador for human rights in, in, in August 2013. Um, only three, three weeks after, we had the COI hearing uh, in Seoul. And I, uh, I arranged with the foreign ministry for the hearing to be held for, it took about a week or 10 days to be held at the Graduate School of International Studies where I'm a, a faculty of. So that's when I really first got to meet Michael, Sonia, and Marzuki, uh, my great friends, um, and the relationship uh, uh, continued. I think that because of the, the advent of the COI and the circumstances at the time, um, my, my feeling is that you know, your job as the new ambassador for human rights right now is probably a little more difficult because I'm thinking that, that at that time, um, our 
great deal of our efforts were made in, the, in terms of awareness of the human rights violations. But since it's been a decade, um, there's got to be more than just awareness. It's, it's, there has to be action plans. I mean, some of them you've, you've listed down. Uh, implementation of the recommendations as laid down by the COI report. And I think therein lies the, you know, the challenges uh, for us that it cannot be just about the rhetorics and you know, resolutions and, uh, and, and raising awareness, which still remains to be very important. But how do we put these into implemental stages? And I have some ideas myself, but I will leave it at that uh, for my first, first take. Yeah. Thank you very much. I just want to give a first to try to Ambassador Lee because the, the not only is because my predecessor, but also I want having a, some kind of objective observations on the, what was the background of the COI. So having said that, I would like to invite the Chairman Michael Kirby. Are you in London now? Yes. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us. And actually, he tried hard to come over here to attend in person but because of other uh, pre-commitment, pre he won't be able to join us in person, but I still thank you to be here online. So as a chairman, Michael Kirby, uh, what will be uh, your like, uh, challenges when you first deal with the COI, uh, the mission? And then what would be the, your, uh, you said, uh, the proud achievement, I would say, uh, to somewhat advance the North Korean human rights issue, although we still have our limitations and difficulties? Well, uh, there's a certain coincidence between where I am now, which is at us and in England, at a conference of state cities, and at the time when I got the first invitation to uh, join the CI uh, and to be its chair, uh, because that came to me here at this council. Uh, 10 years ago. Um, we uh, formed the COI, met in Geneva. Uh, we uh, secured an excellent staff. I must emphasize this to the people who worked on uh, the initial final report were not just the commissions, but uh, the three commissions got on well together with that from different backgrounds, and different work experiences in our lives. And we didn't just accept everything that was put to us. There were some matters where uh, we didn't accept the submission of those who were complaining. But uh, we made a very important decision at the very outset of our work, and that was to proceed by way of public hearings. Uh, the United Nations wasn't very happy about this. They said, no, we've never done that. We, don't, we haven't got the security to be part of your stock. So we said, well, we'll take the risk and we're going to conduct public hearings. And I, I think that was a good idea because a state which is so critical uh, was opened up and uh, the public hearings were filmed and that was safe. Uh, and the film was replayed uh, on the website of the United Nations Human Rights uh, Commission. Uh, and uh, the council, uh, it was our sponsor. Uh, and uh, that is how we kick things off. And the most interesting thing about our establishment was it, we are the only CRI, we were the only CRI that was ever established without a call from vote. Um, a CLI is a very serious step for the Human Rights Council to take, but uh, no one thought, as why I repeated the office for the opportunity to call the vote, such was the concern of the international community. And so we set about our public hearings, we went uh, to uh, Seoul, we went to uh, Tokyo, we went to London. Uh, and we went to Washington, D.C. And I must pay a tribute to the CSIS for the support and assistance that they have given during the course of our work. Um, so the, that's how we, we set to work, and I pay a tribute to Ambassador and Jordan Lee for his uh, support during uh, our environment. If I have a criticism of myself, my colleagues, 
it was that we didn't work hard enough uh, to secure the participation of the then opposition. Because uh, not too long after uh, uh, they reported the COI, uh, there was a change of administration, and then the administration came into force, and we didn't really have enough links for them. They hadn't really participated fully in the work of the COI. Uh, and I've noted quite significant and important changes that have come about since a further change in the situation. That's just the nature of democracy. And we can say this is something that happens in the Republic of Korea, but not in the Democratic People's Republic. Everybody they just don't have that privilege. Anyway, we worked together, prepared our report, the report is readable. The report makes clear findings uh, and places uh, the action plan and the basic action plan before the international community. And because we found many instances of crimes against humanity, uh, the whole point of the crime against humanity is that it shocks the conscience of uh, mankind and it demands that the United Nations and the international community should um, respond and uh, step into the shoes of the nation that has failed to respond. And I pay tribute uh, to Elizabeth Salmon, the new uh, special rapporteur. She treads in uh, very distinguished uh, footsteps. Um, and I'm sure that from her recent experience, she will uh, help to make a difference because I agree with what um, has been said already. Just preparing the reports and just having recommendations is good and important, but there are important achievements that lie ahead. And that's where, um, as Ambassador uh, Li Xinhua said, we've got to have fresh. So I was glad to have the chance to steal away from the uh, statisticians in Japan for this meeting with equal people with the challenge, think clear and think perfectly. And don't think that preparing my board is the end of the journey. Okay, thank you. Well, since I just want to give all of them a chance to having their initial remark, but thank you so much. It's a bit hard, Michael, uh, to, to listen to you. Probably something wrong with the with microphone. So I don't know how, whether we can adjust it. I would appreciate it. But uh, let me just give uh, two other uh, so panelists a uh, chance to talk. So, I have the danger of the cars, and, uh, and there's a big screen in front of me, and uh, if there's a problem with the technology, I will be the last person to try and fix that up. Uh, <laughs> Well, Sorry, I cannot yeah. help you here. <laughs> but anyway, so next is the the Robert the, the Robert King. Are you? Do you feel okay? I, I I know that you wanted to come here in person as well, but unfortunately it didn't work it out. But still, thank you so much to join us virtually. Are you okay? <laughs> so yes, I mean, 24 hours ago I was in the hospital. Uh, I felt better, but I'm delighted to be here. Oh, I hope you feel feel better. But still, I have to give you a hard time, right? So, can you <laughs> can you give me the, your reflection on the establishment of a COI and the content and uh, what kind of uh, like achievement you think a COI made? Please tell me from the perspective of uh, as a special envoy of the United States. Thanks very much for holding this this event. Uh, I appreciate what CSIS and, and uh, what you, uh, Ambassador Li Xinhua, have done in terms of uh, having this event. And, and the last 10 years have been particularly important, and I think it's important that we remember what's been going on. Uh, the uh, three members of the panel played a very important role, and the panel itself was a very useful tool for focusing attention on North Korea human rights. Uh, one of the things that I think was particularly important is even as the panel was beginning its work, uh, there was a very conscious effort to publicize, draw attention to what was going on. Uh, one of the things that I think was particularly helpful as the panel began its work, holding sessions in 
in Seoul and in Tokyo and London, in Washington, to bring people in who had something to say. I remember very much what was going on in Washington. I was there. I was uh, I helped set up the venue for the event, and uh, we were able to do a very good job of publicizing what was going on. We had good media attention, and I think just the process of the creation of the commission, gathering information, was extremely useful in calling attention to what was going on. Uh, the, uh, the second thing that I think was particularly important with the uh, commission is raising the profile of the North Korea human rights issues within the United Nations and its various organizations. Uh, there was additional attention because the commission, uh, the decision to create the commission in the UN Human Rights Council focused a, a good deal of attention to what was going on in that particular issue. Uh, when we had sessions in New York uh, to discuss the results of the report uh, with the third committee of the General Assembly, again, an opportunity to focus attention, to call media attention to this issue. And I think it was a particularly important uh, effort to do that. One of the things that I think was also very helpful was the effort in uh, December of 2014 to have a UN Security Council session discuss the issue of North Korea human rights as a threat to international peace and security. And the process of getting the required number of nine members of the Security Council to approve having a session on the topic uh, with very strong opposition to having a, a discussion of this coming from the, uh, the Russian government and, and particularly from the Chinese government so raising this profile has been, I think, one of the very most important parts of the, uh, of the process of uh, creating the commission. The other thing that I think was particularly important is the gathering of information. Michael was very clever in terms of the way he uh, arranged the report. Uh, the report has a limits on, on the number of uh, pages that could be produced, but he added several addenda with all kinds of additional information, and certainly in terms of, of the standards of uh, human rights violations in North Korea, the commission report was an extremely important part of, of that process. The other thing that I, uh, the other thing that I wanna mention is the three members of the commission were particularly important in terms of how they handled that issue. Uh, all played a very important role. Michael has been uh, very much in the forefront uh, in terms of calling attention to the issue. He has been very generous with the time that he has been willing to spend talking about North Korean issues like today and, and on many, many other occasions. But his leadership uh, was extremely important in terms of raising the issue and doing it in such a way that it had great credibility when the issue was raised. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the second member of the commission, Marzuki Darisman, was also a very important player in the process. Marzuki uh, was serving as the special rapporteur for North Korea human rights and about a second year into his uh, time as the special rapporteur, he seized on creating a commission of inquiry as uh, his uh, issue of, of highest concern. And he played a very important role in terms of bringing together the forces, uh, working with uh, NGOs, with the non-government organizations, but also working very carefully and closely with member countries to bring things together. <clears throat> Marzuki and I met uh, the first time in New York uh, when he was uh, making his report to the General Assembly Third Committee uh, in the fall in October of uh, uh, 2010. Uh, we had good rapport, we had an excellent conversation and uh, within about a year we were 
frequently talking about what do we do in terms of creating this commission. Uh, there were some questions about whether having a commission and focusing that attention on North Korean human rights would be helpful, but Marzuki was very successful in terms of getting around it. One of the things that I think was particularly important is the credibility that he gave to the effort. Uh, as with Michael and his uh, previous positions uh, in Australia in the legal system there, but also in the various uh, UN activities that he'd been involved in. Uh, Marzuki brought the credibility, former Attorney General of Indonesia, who had uh, arranged uh, or had worked to uh, uh, deal with the, the leader of the military, who would played a very negative role in Indonesia, but his efforts were particularly important in terms of bringing that, that process together. Sonia Bezerko, a Serbian diplomat, uh, played a very key role in terms of raising issues, in terms of the people that, uh, that she was able to bring together. And she continued to play a role on the human rights issues uh, after she uh, uh, played that role. Um, so the the commission and the report that was issued by the commission uh, remarkably one year after the commission was created there was a massive report that has changed the way we think about north korean human rights uh, and that i think is is something that we need to be particularly thankful uh, for michael and his colleagues and for what they did uh, the united states has uh, been involved in the human rights issues from the uh, I was uh, very active for uh, eight years in terms of encouraging both internally and externally focus on uh, North Korean attention. Uh, I'm happy that the United States is finally moving towards uh, having a special uh, an ambassador uh, special envoy for North Korea human rights issues. Uh, unfortunately, the process in the United States is going very slowly. Uh, Julie Turner has been nominated. Uh, the Senate has is in the process of considering her nomination. She's not had a confirmation hearing yet. We're now three years, uh, excuse me, three months uh, since she has been nominated, and we still haven't uh, haven't been able to get this taken care of. Uh, I think it's unfortunately a reflection not of the interest on the part of the United States and on the part of the U.S. Uh, Congress, but a reflection of the dysfunction of the ability of Congress to make decisions these days. Uh, but as we look at what do we do and where do we go from here, and was uh, the commission uh, worth doing? Well, well, probably that part you can talk in your second round, if it's okay with you. Sure, that's fine. Okay. I'm happy to do well, that. Let me, let me briefly touch upon the issue you brought about that open discussion at the UN uh, Security Council. Uh, it's been there from 2014, at starting in the wake of uh, the release of the COI report that goes until the year 2017. And unfortunately, that open public discussion uh, didn't take place until yet. But now, the Probably the, the Dr. Chung Park, uh, who will be the, our second session panelist, can tell us uh, more about it. But the U U.S. government appears to be uh, very active in uh, working hard uh, to, to make that happen again, uh, hopefully next year. Uh, you know, there are 15 uh, members in Security Council, including permanent members. To make this session as a public and open, we need a nine vote. And I think we secured eight in countries in favor, in favor of it, and we still need one more country. So if I may uh, list it, that is uh, Ghana, Gabon, uh, Mozambique, Brazil, and uh, UAE. So if one of those countries say yes, then we will be able to uh, open it up. So hopefully uh, that can help. That, that can take place. And for that, I think the U.S. and, of course, Korea and other countries country, uh, can gear up for that purposes. That's what I hope. Um, and also, having said the U.N., uh, here we have a current, uh, the U.N. Special Rapporteur on the North Korean Human Rights Issue, who was appointed uh, last 
August, she is about 10 uh, days younger than, uh, than me, speaking of the taking the position. Uh, since then, although she didn't know much about Korea itself, North Korea itself, she's been a long time uh, the lawyer, uh, the, the law, law professors, and working very hard on human rights issues and working at the United Nations. Uh, and then she's been diligently working about the North Korean issue, particularly in women and children. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to express the, the, my gratitude and respect for your hard work, and we look forward to depending on your continuous work, Elizabeth. So having said that, can you, as your first initial remark, give your observation of what you learn or what you see from this COI report? Uh, hi, hi uh, everyone. Thank you very much for this kind invitation to participate in this panel with such distinguished speakers. And personally, I think that in retrospect, the work of the Commission of Inquiry deserved commendation. Uh, the weight and depth of, of the report, uh, I see that provided a critical mass to propel the international community to launch new efforts to seek improvements to the dire situation documented by the COI. This included, and I think it's very important, the establishment uh, of a United Nations Human Rights Office in Seoul uh, with the mandate to further document and preserve uh, the violations that have occurred and are ongoing within the DPRK. Uh, and I think that this success cannot be uh, underestimated. But uh, moving a little bit forward, I think we need to continue to maintain a spotlight on the obligation of the DPRK uh, to ensure accountability for human rights violations. But, uh, as I say, we also cannot stop here. Uh, I think we need to, to maintain attention on the role of the UN Security Council to engage international accountability mechanisms in the case of DPRK. And we need to go further recognizing the, the reality of the current stalemate within the Security Council. For instance, uh, we can look towards progress on ensuring uh, an arrangement in which the information that member states produce, particularly the Republic of Korea, are securely connected to the central repository being developed by the UN Human Rights Office in Seoul. Uh, Maybe we also need to analyze the different national jurisdictions in countries where North Korean victims reside to understand how laws and institutions can better realize these victims' rights to justice and accountability. Uh, this includes looking at how existing legal and institutional architecture helps or hinders prospects uh, for inter individual criminal accountability. And, but it also involves looking at other steps, such as how civil litigation laws can better facilitate victims' access to compensation as a form of, uh, to form of reparation for, for violations suffered, and how efforts to preserve information can also inform public discourse and understanding including through memorialization efforts. And you know, I, I think that we need to look at the welfare and psychosocial support that is needed uh, by North Korean residing in third countries and how reference to international human rights obligation can help ensure victims' needs are met. In countries where families have experienced the pain of enforced disappearance with family members abducted by North Korea, we need to look at how governments are supporting these family members who are also victims under international law and involving them in, in efforts to gain information on their loved ones and ultimately seek uh, their return. So in some, 
Uh, in moving forward, we need to be more ambitious and expansive uh, in the ways we can ensure some form of remedy and reparation for at least some uh, of the victims. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will ask you more about what you want to do to address those issues later. Uh, Ambassador Lee, the, since you didn't spend short time compared to others, maybe I will just give you two questions. <laughs> well, we talk about some kind of how we establish the COI and some kind of the achievement but difficulties, but we have to move forward, right? So based on those COI, what kind of uh, components or things we can still get from this COI report 10 years ago? And uh, what kind of difficulties and what kind of lessons we should take to move forward? And uh, another thing is uh, we, South Korea, according to the North Korean Act, you appointed as the first ambassador of North Korean human rights, and then I'm the second. But uh, we still didn't, was not able to establish the North Korean Human Rights Foundation, unfortunately. Uh, the, for your reference, uh, we need uh, 12 members in order to uh, launch off the, the, the foundation. And uh, five recommended by the ruling party and another five by opposition party and the two by the, the Ministry of the Unification. So seven has been, have been set to go, but the five members have not been designated yet by opposition party, so that we've been waiting and waiting for what, for a long while, so that the, the UN government decide to make a uh, North Korean uh, Human Rights uh, Committee or Council, we didn't get an English name yet, and they, under the Ministry of Unification for now, and then he is the chairperson of uh, that commission. So maybe my second question is, uh, what would be your role as a chairman of that important position, and then how you can either promote or the spirit and content of the COI uh, to advance the North Korean human rights issues. Well, thank you, Ambassador Lee, for raising uh, that very, very important part of the North Korean Human Rights Act, which was passed in 2016. Um, some of the shortcomings of the act uh, has to be, well, one of the most important shortcomings has to be the inability um, to launch the North Korean Human Rights Foundation, which was to serve in a similar capacity as maybe possibly NED uh, here in Washington, D.C. Um, for first three years, we even had an office set up and the, there was an appropriation of the budget uh, for the foundation, but as you uh, pointed out, um, because of the the lack of cooperation by the, the then ruling party, but now the opposition party, the Democratic Party, uh, refusing to, to recommend five board directors, uh, it is still held in abeyance. Um, so, and it probably will remain as such. So in order to get things moving until that time when the foundation can be created, the government, Yoon Suk Yeol government has um, established this um, North Korea Human Rights Promotion Commission, um, I haven't decided on the exact uh, English name as such, to serve, in, you know, serve the capacity, not quite like the foundation, but to prepare for the you know, uh, coming into being of the, of the foundation in identifying what we could do um, and how we could provide support to the civic organizations and campaigns uh, both in and outside uh, of Korea. I think that the future, um, and which brings to the first question that, that you raise, and I'm sure the panelists uh, will have more to say about that, um, there has to be a very strong focus on, and this is something that you've addressed in your keynote speech, as well, accountability and uh, infusion of information going into, uh, going into North Korea. I think the significant part of the focus has to be on these two items. On the second part, the information 
Um, I think there's um, already a growing, I mean, it has to go beyond just sending of the balloons. Um, I mean, they do send quite significant number of um, USBs and other um, materials, um, but I think we have to be, I mean, in this day of, you know, innovative digitalization, there has to be more than uh, than just the balloons being sent. I think there are, there are discussions of you know, more mobile phones, portable uh, stor storage um, devices, video media players, um, wireless internet, and I think very interesting uh, possibility uh, has recently uh, rose up as a result of the Starlink implications for Ukraine. I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm of the analog generation, so please don't ask me the uh, technicalities of the, you know, how the Starlink uh, works, but I know that they do need terminals, so I don't know how that's going to be uh, set up, but um, Elon Musk has already launched, as, as far as I understand, like something like 2,700 or 2,800 you know, low orbiting satellites, and I think he's going to raise that number to 42,000. That, that's, you know, pretty significant, and you, you know, you, you would have to think that, that with so many satellites being, you know, set up that this wireless internet access by the North Koreans, um, there's, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. With Ukraine, I think there's controversy because of the the, the offensive military use uh, of the Starlink uh, network and system, uh, well, we have no worries uh, with North Korea because that's not the purpose. The, the purpose is to have the North Korean people have access to information, and I think that's most critical. The accountability, we, we talk about accountability. You've, you've talked about accountability. Uh, everyone talks about accountability, but uh, we really have to sit down and demonstrate a political will if we want to make accountability work. What can really be done uh, to bring about accountability? You mentioned uh, naming and shaming. Well, certainly, um, you know, that's, that's a possibility. Um, but this is very important because when crimes are committed and there's no punishment, years down the line, people forget about the crimes that's been committed. So there has to be ways to deal with the thing. And I would raise two, um, two aspects of possible accountability. One has to do with the North Korean defectors in China. We still have a significant number. We, we just don't have a you know, ex exact estimate. I don't know, maybe Special Rapporteur um, Elizabeth Salmon has uh, the numbers, but um, there has to be greater efforts made by the, the UN, the Refugee Office, UN, uh, H, what is it, UNHCR, to have access to the North Korean defectors to determine their status as to, as the Chinese government, you know, keep telling that they're economic, illegal economic migrants. Well, are they? Okay, well, let, let UNHCR determine whether they're illegal economic migrants or there's grounds for them to be determined, considered uh, refugees. But as you all know, that Chinese government flatly rejects any sort of access um, by the UNHCR uh, uh, to these people. So there has to be greater effort made by the UN and the international community for UNHCR to, to do its mandate to do its work um, with the, possibly the, the biggest refugee you know, uh, group uh, in China. And there is, as, um, as part of the agreement between China and the UNHCR of 1995, if there are these sort of issues raised um, between the Chinese government and the UNHCR that you can call for uh, binding arbitration within 45 days. I don't understand why UNHCR has not uh, asked for that. Um, is it because that, you know, they're, they're concerned that they might get kicked out by, by the Chinese government? I don't know. 
Um, but but I, I really think that you know, we've waited too long, way too long, for the UN to simply you know, sit idly by whilst all these problems, including repatriation, and we're not even talking about what these people, what the defectors go through in China in their livelihood. Uh, so much greater effort has to be made, and that's part of the accountability. Do you think that can include uh, your mission for the, the new established uh, I will promotion certainly, council? Yes, I will certainly be raising that issue, and I, uh -huh. I, that will uh, certainly be one of the more important part of what we can do to, to, to somehow get UNHCR to, to do its job okay, uh, in China because the the welfare of the North Korean defector is, um, is very, very important, and it's been for too long uh, ignored. I do have one more issue, but I'll, you know, I'll okay, wait you. Uh, okay. to talk I'll later. I'll just give you another, another okay. opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, you, can you also tell us about uh, what, what's your kind of uh, grievances or kind of uh, things having you just observed the 10 years of process of implementing the, your recommendation of a COI, what are missing there and uh, what, what we should do more? Can you just tell us? It's not my role to have grievances or to feel insulted or disappointed. Um, we did our job and the international community has its job to do. I'd like to mention uh, my thanks to Robert Keane for his work as the US ambassador uh, for um, North Korea. Uh, and I think we've now got various people who are working on this, but uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to make much progress. And um, we've got to face that and we've got to work out what we can do. Now, in the CLI report, in the section of the report that hasn't really been carefully uh, studied and appreciated, we put forward a whole range of little things. I mean, this is how diplomats normally deal with differences between countries. Well, here we're dealing with a, a country which is uh, not cooperating with the overwhelming body of opinion in the United Nations. And no, no. This is the arrangements, uh, sporting arrangements, museum arrangements, academic arrangements. Uh, there should be a, a greater effort to make the little steps. This is what happened in Germany before German reunification. And the, 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 the North Korean regime talks about reunification, uh, as does the Republic of Korea uh, government. Um, it, it, it's important that we take little steps before we take big steps. President Trump possibly had a good idea that we going to see these criminals and so on, but he jumped right into the very part of the most difficult issue, which was the nuclear weapons issue. And uh, we've got to start at the periphery. And I think that's maybe something that uh, the CSIS the uh, conference uh, should, should look at the, the small steps. Uh, unless we deal quickly with the issue of family reunions, it won't matter because all the people that are affected by family reunions will die and therefore they will have lost an absolutely fundamental human right to make their families. So um, I think that's the sort of Task that uh, the challenge that I face before those who have the responsibility now. But we should never think for a minute that the, the CLI claimed, because by reason of our public hearings, by reason of the uh, widespread publicity to the people who came forward and they're telling their stories, shocking stories, uh, they had a chance to spread truth into power. And many of them came up to us after the hearings and said, I know you can't enforce anything, but we feel that we've been vindicated, we've had our say, we've been given our chance, and if that chance uh, is extended, as uh, Special Rapporteur 
uh, Salmon is pointed out by the establishment of the CLI uh, of the office of human rights uh, in the soul. Uh, we've got to keep up the dialogue and uh, emphasize the rights of human beings, uh, the abductees from Japan, uh, the families, the ex Christmas of war from the Republic of Korea. These are things that we must never leave aside. We must continue uh, to deal with them. And I think we should never think that the day will come when uh, the two parts of Korea are united. Uh, they didn't choose to separate. That was not a right of self-determination by the people of Korea. And they have a right to self-determination and they will ultimately come together. And the question is, how can we hasten that day? Michael, there are some NGOs asking me that we may need to uh, make a kind of a, not necessarily new COI report, but updated COI report with some recommendations or suggestions that reflect the change over the past 10 years. If you are asked that kind of request, can you give me a couple, one or two, the important point you would like to add? <clears throat> Well, first of all, I'm, I'm a little bit cautious about having another uh, inquiry because it isn't true to say we've had 10 years of action. We've had 10 years of lack of action. And uh, if you let North Korea off the hook by saying, oh, we'll, we'll park the CLI board to one side, forget about that, so we'll now have another one, then that really isn't facing up to the obligation of a crime against humanity. In that case, you have to respond. And uh, getting the response is going to be the biggest challenge. I don't think there's a lot of extra material that can be added. There have been one or two little improvements um, in, in relation to one special relative that has been given access, but the CFI has been given access and uh, uh, special relative Sam has been given access. So most of what we said and what we recommend remains true today. And uh, uh, if we do have some follow-up, which should be done by the special rapporteur okay. or uh, under arrangements uh, through her, uh, and uh, it shouldn't be to the derogation of, a, of action on the CLI report. It should give an opportunity for improvements to be drawn to notice. But I tell you, that would be a rather short session because there haven't been many improvements. That is the truth of that. And uh, we've got to move to the ones. And involving the SFP um, uh, community, involving people who have escaped from the community, including those in China, I agree with uh, what Jim and B said. Um, uh, they have to be given a greater voice because they are powerful voices for freedom and for liberty and for equality and human dignity. And okay. I think uh, there's plenty of work to be done without creating another um, adjunct CLI. But um, if the, like, the NGO community wants to establish uh, another body, it should be subject to action on the CLI and shouldn't be used as an excuse, including by uh, North Korea, for uh, ignoring the program of action, including the steps that are set out uh, in the CLI and that, if followed, would ultimately bring uh, North Korea to the position that was obtained in Germany of getting a reunification um, it needed some international supporters and champions, but uh, it, it, it has to be uh, done, and it will be done. We can be quite confident that the two Koreas will be reunited, okay. but uh, it has to happen quickly enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, that's good. Uh, Bob, you are the authors uh, together with uh, Victor Cha here in Georgetown and CSIS and uh, Professor Shin Gyok in Stanford. You are the author for How to Balance Security and Human Rights based on your experience and expertise. 
Um, of course, the, the next session, the Scott Snyder and Chan Jae-sung and, and others will talk about the issues in more detailed manner. But still, can I just ask you, uh, when you just give us uh, the, your recommendation of what we should do uh, now, the, uh, the, the 10 years after COI, uh, it, uh, with that, can you just also give us uh, your thought on how we can balance the peace on the Korean Peninsula and human rights uh, issues in North Korea, because I, I think that is a quite complementary to each other. But since the, the term human right appears to be too much politicized in Korea and elsewhere, it looks like a piece on the, Ponin, the Korean Peninsula and uh, the pinpointing human right issue of North Korea appears to be zero-sum game rather than the positive win-win games. So please give me your thought as well. Thanks very much for the uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, I would say about security and human rights. And uh, what we were attempting to do in the, in the book that uh, we put together when I was at Stanford, a uh, conference that we held, was to try to suggest that human rights and security are not in conflict. Unfortunately, the assumption is, particularly by most of the people who deal with uh, North Korea security issues, uh, they see uh, human rights as something that gets in the way of their much more important concerns, and that's the, uh, the nuclear issues, the security issues on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I would argue that, quite frankly, uh, the two are not really separable. Uh, we're not making progress on security issues, even though uh, for the last, uh, well, for the previous uh, American presidential administration, uh, virtually no attention was given to human rights in North Korea at all. And in spite of efforts uh, for high-level summits and for other kinds of meetings with North Korea, uh, there was no effort uh, and no success at making progress on security by ignoring human rights. My argument would be that if we're going to make progress in North Korea, uh, the North Koreans have to move in a more positive direction on human rights. Uh, access to information, for example. Uh, North Koreans have little sense of what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, they have very little information about what's going on in South Korea. And to say that, uh, you know, all we need to do is uh, downpedal uh, human rights will bring uh, success and progress on security is absolutely not true. We've seen it. We've gone through this for the last couple of decades. And I would argue the opposite, that in fact, if we make progress on human rights, we'll then make progress on some of the security issues. And that what we ought to be doing is not uh, arguing that we need to do something with North Korea. We ought to focus on pressing North Korea on human rights, and that will ultimately lead to progress in, in that regard. Uh, you raised uh, questions about... Uh, Bob, Bob, excuse yeah. me. Can I, since the, the Ambassador Lee Jong-un is also a political scientist, of a, 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 a expert on global security, and can I ask him his opinion before you move Absolutely. on to the, your future task? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Ambassador Lee. Okay. Well, I think Bob raised all the um, right issues. Here's the thing. Um, North Korea, the regime, needs both its nuclear weapons and the oppression of human rights for its regime survival. These are the two most significant tools that the regime um, considers to be important, critical, um, to maintain its um, uh, you know, the longevity of the region. That's why it's so difficult. It's so difficult to, to have any sort of progress in either one of the two issues. Um, well, you know, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, North Korea is, um, you know, now has, I mean, the estimates vary. But as you know, you've pointed out that they're firing, you know, just last year, actually, over 80 missiles. And North Korea is, uh, who knows, maybe 40, 50, 60 nuclear warheads. 
There are estimates by various institutions that claim that by 2027, that's just four or five years down the line, we could very well have a North Korea that has 200 or more uh, nuclear weapons. So all these years, you know, over two decades, three decades of efforts, global effort to, to somehow get North Korea to you know, um, demilitarize or, or uh, denuclearize has failed uh, quite dismally. Um, why? Because it is directly correlated to the regime survival. By the same token, uh, that's the case with the North Korean human rights issues as well. Uh, it needs to oppress these people because nuclear weapons are for external purposes to keep the outside world um, you know, uh, at a distance. And internally, for domestic control, it needs to continue to violate human rights uh, in, the, in the domestic context. That's why it, it, it will really take an extraordinary political will uh, rather than just rhetorics and resolutions. It's, it's just not going to work. Um, we've seen it with the nuclear weapons, and we've seen it with the, I mean, Michael was talking about the uh, the recommendations, it's all there. You know, if you ask me, I don't really think that we need another COI to update because I think it's, it's been so comprehensive what Michael and the, the, the earlier COI has done. So it's just a question of, you know, how do we go about what is recommended? Um, and I think, you know, there's not a whole lot that, you know, that, that, that's new that could be uh, added on here. So. I would, I would say that you know, when, I, when I talk about political will, I think the international community has to have the kind of political will that it had in dealing with apartheid system of South Africa uh, in you know, just you know, two decades prior to uh, the, you know, Nelson Mandela becoming the president in 1994. As you all know that in 1974, um, South Africa was suspended of all its activities um, in the UN General Assembly. I'm not suggesting that we should apply the UN Charter um, Article Number no. 5 and Number no. 6, which deals with this you know, actual suspension or the expulsion, because that will require the Security Council um, to recommend to the General Assembly. We're not going to have that with the current uh, Security Council. But still, I think the President uh, can, the President of the General Assembly, can put to this ruling, uh, which can be voted on by the General Assembly, uh, to, to really seriously consider um, the, the, the you know, North Korea's just normal activities within the UN system. I think you all know that last year, we had a, you know, this ridiculous situation where North Korea actually assumed for a month the chairmanship of the disarmament conference. Um, here's a country that's threatening the international peace and security, and it's being, you know, uh, by, this, by the token of this rotational system of the UN, um, that, you know, that happens. So I really think that we have to think very, you know, very hard about what, what the UN and the international community did with South Africa, with the apartheid system, if we really want to make a difference in North Korea, because you know, if you think that, oh, that's just too harsh, you know, that's going to provoke North Korea, you know what, in 10 years' time, we're going to be talking about the same thing, okay? Um, so it, w the buck has to stop now, and we really need to, to put into force these sort of mechanisms that, you know, and there, you know, we have to look, we have to benchmark, because things that work, <coughs> South Africa, apartheid, what you ended, it worked. Let's consider it. Okay, thank you. So, Bob, I will just move on to the, your future task. If you can be brief, it would be good. One quick comment here. Uh, repression is necessary for the North Korean regime to remain in place. Uh, and in order to keep the resources going into the kind of uh, 
nuclear and other uh, military equipment that the North Koreans are spending, uh, they've got to repress their population. They've got to deny access to information. Uh, they've got to keep people from acting and from, from dealing with these kind of things. North Korea is a fragile regime. This is a country uh, that is uh, at the same economic level in terms of uh, gross domestic product as a sub-Saharan African country. South Korea, just across the border, has twice the population, but is, uh, you know, uh, somewhere around the 10th to 12th largest economy in the world. Uh, we're talking about a difference uh, of uh, per capita income between North and South Korea. Uh, South Korea has a per capita income 20 times what North Korea has. And the fact that you have this regime limping along uh, and repressing its population uh, is creating a great deal of instability in the rest of the world and particularly in that part of Asia. And I think it's important that we focus on human rights and focus on pressing the North Koreans by giving them access to information, by having letting them have contact with the rest of the world. Uh, these are important kinds of things, and we need to continue to put pressure on North Korea by doing that. Thank you. Well, Elizabeth, you heard the kind of limitation of the UN system and also hmm. the uh, when it comes to the North Korean defectors, you're also interested in, particularly women defectors. I think role of the UNHCR is important, but obviously UNHCR in China uh, uh, is subject to criticism for their inappropriate uh, the reactions to North Korean people. So having said that, what as a UN Special Rapporteur, uh, the, based on the, those uh, structural limitations the United Nations has, what, what, what do you think? What, what can you do and how you can make things different? Well, very, very difficult question. Uh, as it has been mentioned, the current situation is very different to what it was 10 years ago when the COI was established. Uh, we have faced uh, unforeseen challenges and setbacks. Uh, but uh, we have also witnessed uh, advances in certain areas. Mm, you know, as a mandate holder, I'm taking a, a two-track approach, pursuing both uh, accountability, of course, but also engagement. But you need to recognize that the current situation does not help either track. And But maybe adding this idea of uh, engagement, we cannot lose, I think, the uh, side of, of the ways in which we are facilitating or inhibiting prospects of constructive, as you mentioned, critical, creative, as the European Union says, engagement with the DPRK. I, I, understand, I perfectly understand that some may question the feasibility of this approach. But we, we need to remember that it is the DPRK state that is the primary duty bearer under international human rights law and the primary actor that can uh, bring meaningful improvements. So with this in mind, I think we need to develop more uh, imaginative, but also more sustained ways of seeking uh, constructive engagement with the DPRK. Uh, this will need to include, for instance, fresh thinking on a comprehensive approach and the capacity building assistance that is offered to the DPRK state and considerations about the regional security environment and the security concerns, maybe, uh, of uh, member states. But, uh, and let me be clear on this, it will also require uh, human rights to be integrated into peace and security efforts. I totally agree with uh, what uh, has been said. Uh, integrated human rights into peace and security efforts in a much sustained and principled way. Uh, this includes, uh, for instance, looking creatively at cross-sectional issues, 
uh, such, as you mentioned, as discrimination against women and the absence of women in, in peace and security initiatives in relation to 1325 Women, Peace and Security Agenda. I know that uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, maybe I, I could say that I, I will try to, to focus on this on, on my next report. Thank you, Shima. Thank you. So, uh, Elizabeth, just one quick thing. So, what will be the, your priority area to focus in your next report? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, as uh, you know, you well know, I have identified women and girls as a far priority of my work, uh, based not only on the international obligations of the DPRK, and, and, but also because it's a situation that requires urgent, urgent attention, uh, according to the information gathered by previous mandate holders and also uh, civil society uh, organizations. But what I would like to focus is that I, I want to further look into the role of women in peace and security, both at the national and international levels, because the voices of North Korean FKP women at, at that conference uh, I made in January 2023 in Seoul, uh, made it clear to me that women are already playing a transformative role in the North Korean society and are key to stability and peace, for instance, the case of Jiang Madang or in former uh, markets. So I'm planning to also to focus on this, but also planning to further review the implementation of the recommendations made by the COI later this year and next year, and trying to address the uh, human rights, great human rights violations, including detention system and wide range of accountability efforts, Shima. That's good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, we have about 10 plus minutes left, so I would like to open the floor and uh, please uh, raise uh, questions, any questions to anybody of your choice. Victor, I think you should break your the ice. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is this is really to uh, Xinhua and Zhongwen. Could you say, tell us sort of what the situation now is with regard to the uh, Korean government um, support of <clears throat> NGOs uh, working on North Korean human rights? We know that. There was some rollback of government support in previous years, and I'm just curious what the status of that is now for the Yun government. Thank you. Well, I don't know the exact amount, but definitely the, through the Ministry of Unification, uh, they increase uh, some significant amount of money to support the NGO, but more uh, prominently, they changed the, the structure of the government, saying their bureau is now human rights, comma, humanitarian uh, affairs office. So that indicates the government's strong dedications to promoting the North Korean human rights issues. Uh, so while North, uh, the government tried to build up the, their efforts to supporting North Korea, uh, both in terms of structural and practical manner, uh, there are still high, I mean, the considerable uh, or understandable suspicions among the North Korean, I I'm sorry, NGO community who's working for North Korea, because they said, uh, well, probably now the, the government's interested in supporting us, but what if the regime change again? And uh, that is the one concern. And on the other hand, I had an opportunity to talk with the president or vice president of uh, NED, NED, and uh, IRI and NDI over the past couple of days. Uh, and I delivered uh, the, their concerns to, uh, to those uh, people who are responsible for administration of those organizations. That concern is, they said, if the US, what if the US Congress or, or US international organization who used to help uh, the, the Korean NGOs, uh, the, the regardless of the, the regime nature, what if they increase, decreased the, their support 
the given uh, or the assumption, uh, assuming that the, the Korean government to gear up the, their the financial support to those NGOs, while they are not quite ready to to accept that. So I think st it's not only a question of the money. I think it's a question of the trust. How the the Gap Korea, South Korean government can build up some trust toward the NGO is as important as the how government try to more efforts both financially and other means uh, to support the NGO community to do something to improve the North Korean human rights issues. I will, I will just add, uh, Victor, that um, I think the, our president, President Yoon Suk Yeol, is uh, fully on board in terms of the commitment to, to support the civic organizations uh, and other activities. Um, but as you pointed out, that in the five years of the previous uh, Moon Jae-in government, um, I think it's, it's an understatement to say that you know, there's been a reduction uh, on support to the civic organization. It's been completely shut down uh, and stagnated. And it's actually taking much longer to, to, to recuperate. Um, there's a lot of the sort of lingering legacies of the previous government. So changes are being made but it's obviously not taking place you know, immediately or right off. But the direction is there, and I think the commitment is there by the president. So in a small way, the Ministry of uh, Unification recently um, had a, uh, I think something like $2, $2 million um, sort of um, <coughs> fund to support civic organizations. Um, it's certainly not enough, um, and I think it will grow. Uh, but it also has to do with the the legislature, yeah, yeah um, because the Democratic Party, the opposition Democratic Party, still has a you know resounding majority. So next year's, and as long as they have that, you know that's where the budget comes from, appropriation. So uh, it makes the the Yoon Suk Yeol government's job very difficult um, because it cannot coordinate with the you know legislative body. So next year's election will be critical, and depending on how that goes. Um, you know, we'll, we'll probably have a much clearer idea if the ruling party wins. Hmm. Uh, I think hmm. we will really see the, you know, the, the real capacity and the commitment by the Yoon Suk Yeol government on many things, including the North Korean human rights. Yeah. Okay, let's hope for the sea change. Yes, <laughs> can you identify the, 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 your name and others? <coughs> Uh, thank you for taking my question. I'm Jamin Anderson from RFA Radio Free Asia. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to Ambassador Lee and then Special Rapporteur Salman. Um, relations between Korea and China are getting worse recently, and then do you think it has an like adverse effect on getting cooperation to bring North Korean defectors to South Korea? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Elizabeth, do you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I thank you, thank you very much for this question. I, I've been talking a lot about this issue in the last few days. Uh, as a special rapporteur, and also my predecessor wrote many letters to the government of China, trying to figure out how it's, uh, the situation of the North Koreans living there. The the response is public. That's why I can speak on this. It, it is that they are all in, uh, illegal immigrants, but uh, uh, we think that they are not, uh, it's not the case, and that there is a principle in international law, which is the principle of non refoulement and this means that when there are some uh, elements that uh, the person uh, could be tortured or mistreated if they come back to the country, the other states should not, must not uh, uh, put these people in that uh, situation. So uh, my office, my, my, my mandate, but also the office of the High Commissioner uh, are working a lot trying to reestablish this dialogue with uh, other states and to ask all of them not to return people to this dire situation in the, in the DPRK. Well, I cannot say current Korea-China relation is deteriorating. I think uh, that's the, how we can judge.
the relationship. But even if the relationship is getting worse, I don't think that it directly affect the uh, those the refugee conditions in those border areas, at least for now. But however, I think we have to deliberately think about what kind of a strategy I'm talking about among the international community can make, uh, because there are some spectrum for international pressure, like naming and shaming on one hand, but on the other hand, so-called silent diplomacy, so that we're just uh, dealing with the Chinese authorities to make sure not to forcibly repatriate to uh, the, the refugees to the country. So, so I think we need some kind of international effort. Unfortunately, I don't have a clear solution for that, but uh, I think this is the time we have to think about how we can deal with the Chinese government as important, but still, I think international advocacy and the pressure on the not only North Korean defectors but also those the refugee has a like a basic right to be protected so we have to like constantly the, 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 like release the message toward the, the China because they are obviously signatory members to the UN uh, human rights and the UN refugee law any other questions maybe I will collect one question since we have only three minutes left uh, the co-chair emeritus of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Um, my question was largely just asked, but I wanted to expand it a little, and it has to do uh, with the fact that dealing with North Korean human rights now really does involve dealing with China, uh, not just on the refugee issue. Uh, but you find that at the United Nations, for example, uh, the effort not to uh, have the Security Council um, refer the situation to the International Criminal Court uh, to try to prevent meetings about the Security Council actually dealing with that issue uh, when there is a even informal meeting uh, cutting off UN broadcasts uh, and basically working at the UN to be eroding the entire international human rights um, system that's been set up since the Second World War uh, in its own dealings with its own human rights issues. So it's a much larger issue, but I wondered if some of the speakers could comment. I mean, Michael Kirby and the COI report, I believe, were just about the first to include uh, the China dimension, I would call it. Um, and he did do that carefully. He did do that with explanation in the report. Um, I wonder how, beyond the refugee issue, um, but also including that issue, uh, there's any strategizing or how we are developing a strategy at the, in the international community to deal with North Korea, which is growing increasingly impervious to improving its human rights record uh, because of the Chinese support. So it becomes a larger issue to have to deal with, mm -hmm. and I don't know the full contours of it either. Okay, thank you. Why don't I just give up? One minute each to Michael Kirby and the Bob King. Well, uh, there's a very good book that's just been published by Robert King and his colleagues, and there's a very good chapter in that book about Germany and whether it gives any analogy to the situation uh, in North Korea and the world. But the point that is made is it's not exactly the same and there is no international champion, as Gorbachev ended up being in Germany. But many times in the years before German reunification, it West Germany have a way on its principles. The principles of the rule of law, the human rights, and the support for the UN system. So I think that should be the lesson for the administration in uh, the Republic of Korea, whoever they are, you don't make progress by backing away from the fundamental principles of the international system, uh, the rules system, and universal human rights. And I hope that that is a, a message that is going clearly from NGOs and from uh, academics and from people like uh, the ambassadors uh, Lee years ago. Uh, Stick by your principles. Be courteous, insist on the universal human rights, uh, 
and wait for opportunities which will certainly come. Thank you. Bob, maybe 30 seconds if it's okay with you. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> China is one of the biggest problems we face right now internationally. And the problems that, North, that China is, is creating in places like Taiwan, uh, in terms of uh, other parts of the world, it's becoming increasingly assertive, increasingly negative in terms of its impact. And it, China, unfortunately, has to be seen in this broader uh, context. Uh, I think the Chinese consider the North Korean issue to be a fairly minor one. Uh, there are North Koreans who want to leave. Uh, that's not helpful for us because North Korea is an ally and we're not going to disrupt uh, the relationship with Pyongyang uh, just because people want to get out of North Korea. The Chinese are a real problem in a whole series of areas. And this is just one of the more painful ones in terms of the impact on the human rights. Uh, I don't have any great solutions, but I think we need to continue our efforts to put, to put pressure on China and to encourage North Korea to move in a more positive direction. But it is not an easy issue and there are no easy answers. Thank you. Well, as Michael Kirby and Lee jong -un has mentioned, the COI report itself is uh, comprehensive enough to cover all the recommendation and everything. So now is the time to uh, strengthen our political will and implementation power to move on so that we don't have to talk about the same thing and 10 years after now. Uh, for that, Elizabeth, probably you and my job is very important. So having said that, let me just conclude uh, this session. Thank you so much, you all of you participating in here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will take a short break and we'll convene for the second panel in about, uh, in about 15 minutes. Thanks.
啊啊啊啊。Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening for those who are joining us online. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the second panel, uh, Taking Stock of North Korean Human Rights. My name is Ellen Kim. I am Deputy Director and Senior Fellow of the Korea Chair at C here at CSIS. So in the previous session, we, dis we heard from the uh, panelists about their assessment of COI report, um, its impact, its achievements, and you know, its contribution to the North Korean human rights. Yet limitations and challenges they saw. So since the publication of the CO report in 2014, we are in a much more diffi uh, diffi different uh, environment. Um, since the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 pandemic inside North Korea, the country has been under national lockdown for three years. And there appears to be a serious food shortage issues and the external environment has, uh, has dramatically changed as well. Um, in, in addition to North Korea's increased uh, nuclear advances, its uh, increased nu uh, nuclear assertiveness, uh, we also have uh, US-China competition and Russia's war in Ukraine. So there's many things that are happening and I think there's many things we can unpack here. So based on that, I'll, in this panel, I'd like to continue our conversations about what's next how to move forward and how to improve human rights in, inside North Korea and enhance international cooperation despite this difficult um, environment. So for that, we have a very uh, distinguished uh, panel uh, guest here in our panel and you have uh, their extensive bio, but let me properly introduce them. On my right is Ambassador Robert Joseph, a senior scholar at the National Institute for Public Policy Previously, he was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security and also served as a U.S. Special Envoy for Nuclear Non-Proliferation. Before that, he served in the National Security Council as a Special Assistant to the President, Senior Director for Proliferation Strategy, Counter-Proliferation, and Homeland Defense. Uh, he also has extensive teaching experience at various universities, including National Defense University, uh, National War College, and Fletcher School, of, um, and so on. Next is Dr. Chung Park, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Mo uh, Multilateral F Affairs, Deputy Special Representative for the DPRK. Before she joined the Biden administration, she was a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, held senior position at CIA, was a Deputy National Intelligence Officer for Korea at the National Intelligence Council. Her book on uh, becoming Kim Jong-un was translated into multi uh, multiple languages and was widely uh, read by many people. On her right is uh, Mr. Scott Snyder, Senior Fellow uh, for Korean Studies and Director for, of the Program on U.S.-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. From 2008 to 2011, he served as an adjunct fellow and project director uh, for CFR's Independent Task Force on Policy toward Korea, Korean Peninsula. Uh, Mr. Snyder is also author and editor of many books and articles on Korean politics and foreign policy. He has an upcoming book on U.S.-Korea Korea alliance under siege, which means that we all have to read when it's out. Um, next is Dr. Sheena uh, Chestnut Grayton. Um, she is associate professor at the Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, where she directs the Asia Policy Program. She is concurrently a senior fellow at the AEI, and before that, she was an assistant professor and a co-director of the Institute for Korean Studies at the University of Missouri non-resident senior fellow at Brookings, adjunct fellow with the CSIS Korea Chair. Uh, she's also working on, uh, her work appeared in many academic journals. Uh, she also has an upcoming book on politics of the North Korean di uh, diaspora, which I hope we can discuss in, our con in the context of North Korean human rights. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Dr. Chun jae Song, a uh, professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University. He is currently the chair of the, and chair of the advisory committee to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a member of the advisory committee of the Ministry of Defense, ROK Army, and Navy. He is also chair of the National Security Center at the EAI. Uh, previously, he was the president of the Korean Association of the International Studies. Um, Dr. Chan, despite your um, uh, throat, throat, thank you so much for joining us today. So with that, uh, let me, let's get started. And I would like to begin with uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Park, um, in, the, um, in the previous session we heard about you know, the significance of the COI report, but there's many challenges, 
Obviously, the situation is very difficult. It seems like um, North Korea, there's no much, not much change, of, uh, change in its behavior. There's a food crisis. Um, North Korea doesn't, you know, um, despite number of approaches that Biden administration and Korean South Korean government made uh, for dialogue, North Korea doesn't respond. So it seems like we are in a very difficult situation. So I'd like to ask you, um, what, how do you assess the current situation and what is Biden administration North Korea policy and what is efforts to improve North Korean human rights? Great. Uh, thank you, Ellen, and thanks to all of you. And really great to be on this distinguished panel uh, with my colleagues here to talk about this very important uh, issue. Um, let me start with what's the, what's the policy um, that we've had since um, the Biden-Harris administration came in. Uh, I'll note that the DPRK policy was one of the first policies to be, policy reviews to be completed in the spring of 2021. Um, and in the, in the policy, we were, we committed, the U.S. was committed to uh, uh, pursuing diplomacy and dialogue with the DPRK, uh, protecting through extended deterrence our allies and partners and our troops and the U.S. people. Um, and to keep human rights at the center of that policy, regardless of what, what is going on in the nuclear um, and ballistic missile um, programs uh, and the status of negotiations or lack thereof. Another piece of that is that we continue, and we said then and we continue to encourage humanitarian aid and assistance into the country, um, and we've made uh, advancements and progress, uh, or at least try to, um, uh, uh, execute those uh, those elements of our policy since uh, the spring of 2021. I will note that on the diplomacy and dialogue part, we have reached out multiple times to the DPRK orally, in writing, through third parties, um, to with with proposals to to discuss all sorts of issues, including COVID, humanitarian assistance, etc., cetera, uh, et cetera. So, uh, but but. Despite our multiple attempts at outreach through various methods, what we have received in advance or in, in response has been an unprecedented number of ballistic missile tests, new weapon, tests of new weapons, um, and threats, uh, threatening rhetoric that point to uh, drills that are related to tactical nuclear weapons use. So we, so, so in the past couple of years, we have seen DPRK really ratchet up its uh, nuclear weapons program um, and hew closely to what, what Kim Jong-un has said about, uh, about improving, diversifying, um, and making more sophisticated his nuclear weapons program. Um, we've, uh, so since the beginning of 2022, I think our count is 80 plus uh, ballistic missile tests, um, including 11 ICBM tests. Um, we've seen drills, we've seen threatening rhetoric coming from the DPRK, um, and, as a, and as a result, we have, um, throughout this whole um, relationship and throughout this whole policy, um, we've coordinated very carefully with the, with the ROC and, and Japan, um, bilaterally, trilaterally. Uh, Special Representative Kim had a trilat most recently, a couple of weeks ago in Seoul. Um, so, so that coordination has been very robust, as well as our military responses um, to, uh, to make sure that our allies and our troops are safe. Um, but let me point to the human rights issue, the, the purpose of this panel. Um, one is that I'm extremely thrilled to, that the President has nominated Julie Turner, a colleague of mine at the State Department, to be the Special Envoy uh, on, on DPRK human rights. I don't know, I mean, she is one of the top-notch um, deep expertise on DPRK human rights, a, pra a policy practitioner, and I'm really looking forward to her confirmation to, to work with her um, on these critical issues. Um, uh, for, for our part, um, from the EAP side, East Asia Pacific Affairs Bureau side, um, that we see human rights as part and parcel of the WMD programs. Um, as you've seen Ambassador uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield say at, at, in, U in New York, um, is that the regime continues to divert resources away from its people um, to his nuclear weapons program. I, and I think the, the South Korean um, officials and, and the government has, has relayed, I think maybe, or some have estimated um, how much those missiles cost and mm -hmm. what and what, it would really, um, 
a regime could do with that kind of money to support its people. Um, the, you know, I think um, progress on human rights, from my perspective, on de by the by the uh, by the Kim government, um, for me, would be a key signal that it's that is serious about denuclearization and complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is our policy. Um, in recent times, you know, we you know we really would like to elevate and, and well re-elevate the human rights issue at the UN Security Council. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of uh, pushback on that, um, but this happened, you know, we did that pursuant to the COI. So from 2014 to 2017, the UN Security Council had North Korea human rights on, on the agenda, uh, but since then it's been addressed as any other business, um, in, in, most recently in December 2022. We, in February, prepared a letter for the, Security, for the then Security Council president requesting that human rights uh, remains a matter of Security Council concern. Um, and that letter garnered 62 signatures, which was double what we had back in 2022. Uh, last month, uh, the United States worked with Albania, Korea, and uh, Japan to host an informal ARIA formula meeting of the Security Council on DPRK Human Rights, and we'll continue to push uh, to, to elevate this issue with the UN Security Council. Um, the, the situation is, is not great. Um, I, you know, I, I was with Ambassador Yi in, in Seoul, and, and we have talked several times and have a, a couple of events together um, that were marking the, the 10th anniversary of the COI report, um, things have not gotten better. In fact, I think uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and the regime's shutting down of its borders has probably exacerbated the situation in the DPRK. Um, and you know, I think we, we want to make sure that if the DPRK opens up in the way that China has opened up in, in recent months, um, that we will continue to urge that humanitarian assistance is the first thing that goes in. Yeah. So let me stop there um, on that and look forward to my colleagues' thoughts and comments on this issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now I'd like to turn to the rest of the panelists and ask each of your initial thought on where we are, um, what we know about the current situation inside North Korea, uh, how we can promote the human rights inside the country despite this current situation. So let me start with the Ambassador yeah, Joseph. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here today. Uh, the first question is, why is a guy like me in a place like this? Why, a per why with a person with my background is here talking about human rights? My experience over the course of 26 years as a career civil servant was focused on nuclear deterrence, nuclear arms control, nuclear non-proliferation. And over the course of those years, I would say that human rights and the nuclear issues were treated as separate and separated topics, almost like two silos, silos of excellence perhaps in each, but with very little communication in between. There was one exception to that, and I go back a long way now, and that was the Reagan administration. And in 1987 and 1988, I was a lowly Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. No offense meant. <laughs> but I did have the- I, I feel that. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get even, yeah. what can I tell you? But I had the opportunity to have a first row seat with the top leadership, because at the Pentagon at that time, the assistant secretary that worked the issues of arms control and nuclear non-proliferation, that position was vacant. And then the undersecretary position became vacant. And so the only person between Cap Weinberger, well, I was the only person between Cap Weinberger and, uh, and myself on, on, these, on these issues. And what I observed there was that Lip service was given by the bureaucracies to human rights. Well-intentioned, well-meaning, but it didn't really compete with the priority that was given, again, by the State Department, by the Defense Department, and other agencies within sort of the national security group. It didn't compete with 
the real issues, the real issues of negotiating the INF agreement and the START agreement, and even at the highest level, at the State Department and elsewhere, there was a resistance to including human rights because that would create an atmosphere in which the negotiations on what really mattered wouldn't go, would, 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 would not be conducive to that. In fact, it would alienate the Soviet leadership. But Reagan insisted that human rights be part of the agenda. It was a four-part agenda that we had with the Soviet Union, including arms control, regional issues, economic issues, and human rights. And Reagan insisted that, that human rights be treated as a priority. Because Reagan's approach was not just, not just to achieve arms control agreements, which were very, very important, but he sought the end of the Soviet Union because he understood that as long as the Soviet Union existed, the United States would continue to be faced with the nuclear threat from the Soviet Union and that the human rights condition within the Soviet Union would not be fundamentally changed. The people of the Soviet Union would not achieve the basic dignity and human rights that they deserved and the freedom that they deserved. And Reagan was, was insistent on this because he saw the Soviet Union as evil. And he said so. He, sa he, th he thought that the captured nations of Central and Eastern Europe were being brutalized by Soviet occupation. And he was concerned about the human rights inside the Soviet Union because he saw sort of the, the, the freedom of these people as the greatest and, and most effective means to achieve all of our national security objectives. And so he favored human rights not just because it was the right thing to do because he considered it a moral imperative, but also because it, it was the path to achieving our national security goals. And he was ridiculed. He was ridiculed by the professionals in particular. O overly simplistic, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, a couple years later, the Soviet Union went away. And you remember you know, Reagan's sort of famous quote about when asked about his strategy toward the Soviet Union in the Cold War. He said, we win, they lose. And he wasn't, he wasn't an advocate of detente. He wasn't an advocate of managing the relationship. He wanted to end the Soviet Union. And he saw the, the, dynamic, the internal dynamics of the Soviet Union moving in that direction. And that was a real lesson for me. And when I went to the White House to be sort of the prime on, on issues of non and counter proliferation, and I started working in great detail uh, the, you know, the, the threats from Iran and the threats from North Korea in particular, it became very clear to me that these threats on the nuclear side will remain and only get worse as long as, in this case, the Kim regime exists or the ayatollahs and the religious dictatorship of Iran continues to exist. It's not going to go away. It's not going to be the same. It's going to get worse. And that was the premise of a recent effort that uh, I had the uh, opportunity to, to lead with uh, national security experts and with human rights experts. Not treating them as separate issues, not treating them as separate silos, but bringing them together and coming up with an alternative strategy to what we have pursued for the last 30 years. We have 30 years of failure across five administrations, Republican and Democratic like, when we have put the denuclearization uh, of North Korea through negotiations as the centerpiece of our approach. We have failed. Exhibit A, of course, is the growth in the nuclear uh, arsenal of, uh, 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 of uh, North Korea, from two to three to 40 to 60 today to, according to a RAND study, uh, possibly over 200 by 2027. That's four years from now. And imagine dealing with a North Korea that has an arsenal and an incredible capable uh, ballistic missile force 
as well as hypersonics and, their, and, 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 and other means of delivery. But imagine dealing with them four years from now when they have an <coughs> arsenal larger than France and larger than Great Britain. And remember, this is a regime that has sold everything that they have developed. And they have already exported nuclear technology. I don't think they see any barrier at all to providing, selling nuclear weapons to re, ro, other rogue regimes, as, as well as, I, I would say, as well as t uh, terrorist entities. Why wouldn't they? And I know the answer is, well, we will set up a bright red line. And we will say, if they do that, there will be enormous consequences. I've gone through this over and over and over, over the course of a good number of administrations. Okay? It's like they talk about human rights. Everybody talks about human rights and how important it is. But, you know, you know North Korea, has always crossed our red lines. And what have we done? We've always backed down. And there are a whole number of reasons for this, but I don't, I don't think that there's any sort of reason to believe that it would be different the next time. I mean, this is, our, our policy really does sort of go to Einstein's definition of insanity. For 30 years, we've been doing the same thing over and over and over and we expect a different result. It's not going to happen until we fundamentally shift our thinking and our strategy. I mean, if we have a strategy. I don't, I don't think we really have had a strategy over the course of the last number of administrations. We've had a policy, we've had a, we've had a strategic objective, but we haven't had the means of combining all of the tools of statecraft to achieve that. And what, what we in this recent sort of study did, uh, and in our document pr proposing an alternative strategy, was place human rights up front. Now, it's one tool. It's not a silver bullet. It has to be combined with the other tools. It has to be combined with containment, with defense, with deterrence, with economic sanctions, and equally important with diplomacy. So the, the idea is that as long as the Kim regime exists, we will have not only the nuclear threat, which will get worse and worse, but we'll also have the human rights condition in North Korea, which I believe will also get worse, just given the way that this regime has adapted to new technology as a means of repression. So the objective has got to be the end of the regime. And the greatest vulnerability of the regime is its own people. And what we are proposing is a comprehensive, in the, in the context of human rights, and again, it's one tool of a broader strategy, but in the context of human rights is a very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, information and influence campaign, as well as other tools that we can use to affect change within uh, North Korea. Again, it's not, it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to happen quickly, but it can happen, but it can only happen through the North Korean people themselves. We are explicit that this is not an end to diplomacy. This is not the, uh, you know, the, the advocacy of the use of preemptive force to change the, re to change the regime. This is about, we, uh, about encouraging the North Korean people to achieve their freedom which in turn will provide for their human rights and an end to the nuclear threats that we face. And again, I don't want to have this conversation, if I'm still around in five years, I wouldn't want to have this conversation uh, about sort of the North Korean nuclear capability because it'll be off the charts. And I don't think from a human rights perspective, you want to have this conversation five years from now either when the human rights situation just gets worse, as it has over the course of the, of the last 10 years, it's only gonna get worse. And the only solution, because this regime is not gonna moderate, the only solution is an end to the regime. And that's what's been missing in US policy for 30 years. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ambassador, uh, for a very powerful statement. Um, so I'll go to uh, Scott. Okay, well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the panel. I appreciate uh, Ambassador Lee's invitation and Victor's invitation to be here. Um, I usually, I, I have been uh, 
an active observer of this uh, discussion on human rights, but I have not really had that many opportunities to participate. And uh, following John and Bob Joseph, I'm also keenly aware of the fact that um, I think of my job more as like a restaurant review critic, uh, and I actually have not had any cooking experience, uh, a point that my wife reminds me of regularly. <laughs> Uh, and so I am at a little bit of a deficit, uh, but what I want to do is step back and first maybe start with a point that I think is absolutely correct, that the North Korean nuclear problem and the human rights problem are connected in the respect that both of them are related to North Korean impunity and the failure of the ability of the U.S. and the international community to hold North Korea accountable. And so I think that is absolutely correct. Um, and, and yes, I absolutely agree that we need to find ways to encourage change from within in North Korea. But I'm also a little bit daunted by the context. Uh, and I'm also sobered by the fact that Bob Joseph uh, looked forward five years, but I can look back to actually the same meeting that Lee Jong-un was talking about in 2015, uh, and I kind of think, well, aren't we having the same conversation? Uh, and so that's one of the greatest frustrations, I think, related to this particular beat, is that it's very hard to figure out how to get a foothold uh, in terms of actions that can truly induce change. And I think that there are a couple of factors here that really stand out from this morning's conversation and from the setup for this panel that kind of unfortunately reinforce that. The international context has worsened. Um, the uh, major power rivalry inhibits our ability to be able to address this issue as effectively as desirable. North Korea's self-quarantine has limited our aperture to understand what is going on inside the country. And frankly, if we knew, I think that it would only heighten our concern about this issue because I'm pretty positive that human rights conditions inside North Korea under self-quarantine, under conditions of pandemic, have only gotten worse. Uh, and we know the nature of the regime. Um, as indicated in the previous panel, it's represented in the previous COI report. I mean, this is a regime that I think, number one, holds political loyalty uh, as the highest value uh, which means complete disregard for human rights. Uh, and it distorts the society in some incredible anti-human rights ways. It's an anti-human rights system. Um, uh, and it punishes uh, political disloyalty uh, with imprisonment and starvation. Uh, and so, you know, all of those issues, I think, are probably only worse by virtue of the fact that actually we have almost no on the ground witnesses right now inside North Korea. Uh, and so, you know, that's a huge problem. Uh, and then the last panel, I think was really instructive also because the other way in which the international context has really deteriorated uh, is related to the fact that almost 10 years ago, there was a COI report that came about as a result of um, the uh, decision uh, in the international community that there was political will to produce a COI report. Um, and we had representatives from the US and South Korea working actively on this issue in concert with each other. Uh, and as I was looking up here uh, in the previous panel at Lee Jong-un and Lee Xinhua, it occurred to end Bob King uh, on screen, there's not a second generation of human rights focused policy. Uh, there's a gap. And so what that means is that a lot of what Ambassador Lee is doing, uh, and hopefully joined by an American counterpart soon, is trying to recreate through power of discourse some sense of momentum and pressure and focus on this issue that frankly has been gone. And so in some respects, I think you can say that we are you know, governments are in the process of reinventing the wheel uh, on this particular issue. Uh, and so it's a huge challenge to try to recover and recreate the environment that had existed. 
And, and so in some ways, I would argue that looking back to 10 years ago does give us at least a roadmap for where we need to go uh, in terms of thinking about the elements that are required. Uh, and then also, I just have to note that in the previous discussion, uh, it was very clear in South Korea, there's a politically polarized environment that paralyzes the domestic debate. Uh, and it has uh, hamstrung um, the implementation of a law uh, on North Korean human rights uh, that would become a powerful instrument for South Korea to help take the lead on this issue. And so we have to kind of, I think, acknowledge where we are um, and, um, you know, beyond naming and shaming, which I think that uh, especially we like to have conferences in order to do, um, it's really about figuring out what are the ways in which to mobilize action on this issue that generate pressure from the North Korean government. And so the final comment I just will make is that I think one of the really crystallizing moments in the context of the publication of the COI report was the fact that North Korean diplomats felt pressure in UN venues to defend uh, the leader, primarily. Uh, but, you know, it was because of the focus on human rights. And so I think that, you know, many people at these conferences have, have um, pointed to that particular point, but um, I have to go back and retread that ground because it was a moment in which um, uh, concerted international pressure uh, it did not bring about, I don't think it brought about any kind of change in the North Korean or Kim Jong-un's perspective uh, on how to deal with human rights, but it did force him on defense in some very interesting ways uh, that, in my view, represent one of the very rare moments where we saw the North Koreans responding uh, to the international discourse. So I'll stop there. Uh, Dr. Sheena Gretchen. Great, thank you very much. Thanks to Ambassador Lee and to, to Dr. Cha and to Dr. Kim as well for uh, the invitation to, to be on this panel today. Um, the speakers who've come before me this morning are a, a difficult act to follow. Um, so I spent some time thinking about what I might say because it, it, it does feel at times like the conversation is, is somewhat cyclical. Um, and that we come back to these same problems without a lot of sense of progress. Of what I might say that would be somewhat different um, than the, the excellent set of comments that have already been made so far this morning. Um, and what I wanted to do was to actually juxtapose the 10 year anniversary of the Commission of Inquiry with the fact that we also have had just over 10 years, slightly longer, um, uh, with Kim Jong-un in power. Um, and to talk about a few of what I see as the key developments under his leadership and what implications that has for how we think about human rights and for the strategies that we might craft to deal with human rights challenges. Um, one of the things that I've seen, uh, and I should say that some of the, the work um, on this particular, the, what I, the question I'm about to talk about um, was actually done when I was an adjunct fellow at CSIS, so I remain very grateful to the Korea chair for their, their support of the, the project. Um, one of the things that I've seen, I think we've seen take shape inside the DPRK over the course of Kim Jong-un's first decade plus in, in power um, has been a particular model of a relationship between the, poli the, the, um, the political apparatus and the North Korean economy. Um, and it's one that we've actually seen applied elsewhere, particularly in China and in, in Vietnam, um, where that model is called something like party state capitalism or market Leninism. And essentially what that, that does um, is to pair market, certain very controlled um, market-friendly changes with um, enhanced political control on the part of, of an authoritarian regime. Um, and the reason this matters and why I wanted to spend a moment on it is that I think for a long time, and especially maybe when the, the COI report came out, there was some hope that marketization was eroding state and regime control from the grassroots level, from the bottom up. Um, and that marketization was fundamentally incompatible in some way with regime control. Um, and I think that the past 10 years really uh, challenge us to rethink that, that assumption. Um, what we've seen is that the regime has responded to uh, the erosion of state control and has figured out how to incorporate certain market-based changes, particularly in ways that allow them to capture the rents from market-based uh, economic activity and use it to enhance rather than to weaken the foundations of, of regime control. 
Um, and so I think in some ways marketization has actually been captured and redirected by the regime for its own, its own purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes when we use analogies from the Soviet Union or Eastern Europe um, to think about North Korea as a sort of ossified communist bureaucracy. And I think a much better analogy, again, looking at China, looking at Vietnam, is to think of this as a, a, a regime with a, an adaptive guerrilla history that gets repurposed for uh, adaptation and response to threats, both within and externally. Um, in ways that, that facilitate regime survival. Um, and so I think uh, it's important when we talk about marketization to just reframe the way that marketization has occurred because the regime, I think, has effectively captured a lot of the marketization changes and figured out how to regulate them to its own advantage. Um, the other trend that we see that's consistent with this model of market Leninism or party state capitalism um, is just enhanced political control across the board. Um, and we've seen this in North Korea, where Kim Jong-un has used political purges, some of which have been done under a, an anti-corruption campaign that Chris Carruthers and others have written about, but I frankly don't get, think gets enough uh, attention um, in a lot of our policy discussions. But there's also um, you know, laws against reactionary ideology and anti-socialist behavior that have enhanced ideological uh, control. Um, the pandemic has certainly strengthened that at a basic level movement, both domestically within the country was sort of re-tightened. Uh, control over movement was, was tightened again as, and the border almost completely shut down. Um, but I think, but there's also a really important sort of positive propaganda purpose um, and positive propaganda distribution strategy that the, the North Korean regime has employed as part of this ideological campaign um, an emphasis on ideology that, that Kim Jong-un has, has pursued. Um, I just finished with some colleagues um, a paper on North, uh, the early period of the use of propaganda under Kim Jong-un. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but we were actually able to look at not just what the content of propaganda messages were, but which parts of the population they were being distributed to. Um, again, small sample, not clear how representative across time it is, um, but we were actually able to pretty clearly document that the North Korean regime has a very sophisticated and subnationally varied propaganda strategy it, that is very consistent with what we know about how authoritarian regimes basically pursue survival. So it's aimed at mobilization around economic production, particularly agricultural production, and military service for sort of audiences outside Pyongyang, kind of mass audiences, and it's aimed much more at co-opting and promising rewards um, through party and other mechanisms to North Korean elites, right? And, and so what I wanted to do is just close, I, and I didn't get to the diaspora uh, part, so maybe we can come back to that in, in later discussion, but I, I don't want to talk for too long. Um, I think there are sort of two key lessons that, that I think maybe we need to, to draw from that. It's common to think about China's role primarily in terms of repatriation and the, the treatment of, of North Koreans in China or at the UN. But I also think we need to realize that there's at least a third major way in which China shapes human rights in North Korea, and that's through the, the basic model of domestic governance and political control. That there's very sort of, uh, um, I think, tight parallels between the direction that Xi Jinping has taken China Again, there's lots of differences that we can talk about, and I don't want to overstate the comparison, but the idea of this market Leninism, party-directed capitalism, um, is a direction that both North Korea and China have moved in over the course of the past decade. And I think unless we understand that part of the way China exercises its impact on North Korean human rights is through a domestic model of how you exercise political control, that we're going to miss part of the story that's really important. And then the second piece is that the North Korean regime is not, um, it is very, I think, sophisticated and varied in how it tries to uh, shape the information environment in North Korea. It's got huge advantages. We all know that. But I think the fact that we can, we now understand that there are very different messages being sent to ordinary citizens in North Korea versus the North Korean elites in Pyongyang probably is a, a, a finding, and we know a little bit about what the content of those messages are, that we should factor into our own information strategies um, and try to use them to make them more, uh, more targeted and more effective on our side as well. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the next round of questions. Thank you, Ellen. Dr. Jessel. Okay, thank you very much.
Uh, sorry for one of my voice. If I can continue, I will ask Alan to read my memo uh, that I shared. So let me focus on my memo. Uh, for human rights issue, I have three points. Uh, the first one is crucial to address human rights issues is, uh, in a sustainable manner. Uh, from South Korea's view, uh, I think uh, South Korean government, the current government, tries to and uh, needs to establish a clear vision for uh, human rights diplomacy in general that reflects South Korea's global identity, not just with regard to the North Korean human rights. Uh, human rights diplomacy uh, in general for South Korea is not yet a well-established component of South Korean diplomacy. So while South Korea's democratic identity is sufficient to drive human rights diplomacy given the country's long and intense <coughs> democracy, it is still fair to say that uh, South Korea's human rights diplomacy is in its early stages. So this will help if we continue to develop uh, our uh, human rights diplomacy in general. Uh, that will help establish credibility that South Korean diplomacy is prioritizing a more fundamental direction of uh, human rights without politicizing or secretizing the issue of North Korean human rights. Another uh, significant challenge for South Korea to deal with North Korean human rights issues is the lack of a sustained and specific interest from South Korean public in North Korean human rights. Uh, according to one survey, North Korean human rights or defectors are not even among the top 300 human rights related search terms in big data analysis. So although uh, human rights issues in general are actively discussed and debated in South Korea, discussions about North Korean human rights are very much limited in South Korea. So this lack of public interest in North Korean human rights issues undermines the effectiveness of government's human rights diplomacy efforts. Uh, if we compare it with North Korean nuclear crisis, for example, there is consistent consensus among South Korean public that we have to go for the complete denuclearization. Uh, only based uh, on, the, on the basis of those kind of public consent, then our government can pursue a sustainable North Korean human rights uh, diplomacy. The second point is that North Korean people are the central actors who can make a long-term commitment to improving human rights in North Korea. Despite the limited results for the past two decades, the uh, UN has uh, did a lot of efforts, so the international community has made significant efforts uh, to improve human rights in North Korea. Even if we cannot see the result uh, with some clear evidence, but I believe that North Korean human rights awareness in North Korea is increasing. As Ambassador Ishina <coughs> touched upon the North Korean government use of South Korean broadcasts as an excuse for severe human rights repression indicates the influence of international society and the changing political consciousness of North Koreans. Uh, especially, there is a lot of study uh, about so-called market generation of North Korea who experienced uh, great distress in 1990s and they become more informed about the outside world and their awareness of human rights is improving uh, this uh, cautious uh, expectation. However, this development does not necessarily mean that growing external links build trust. Uh, if you look back at South Korea's experience, our pro-democracy movement was able to move forward more sustainably when it had the confidence that it was supposed uh, to be supported by the international community. Therefore, it is crucial to convey that the international community has a great interest in the human rights of North Korean people, and it is not politicizing the issue. So we, uh, so we have to make a concerted effort to clear, uh, clearly communicate the purpose of information flow is to empower North Koreans, and that it will be most effective if the source of information is North Korean defectors who already experienced South Korean society. 
thirdly, uh, about the relationship between security and uh, human rights. North Korea is currently a hereditary dictatorship that is unprecedented in history, as we all know. So in the process of denuclearization, there is a question of whether a denuclearized North Korea can continue to maintain its regime and develop its economy. The international community has been attempting to provide a concrete and reliable prospect of the regime and economic development of denuclearized North Korea. This process will require active political and economic relations between North Korea and the international community, and this process may change the consciousness of North Korean population and even create a civil society. If Kim Jong-un's regime develops nuclear weapons, but then they achieve complete denuclearization through negotiation, and if, still he, if he seeks to remain in power for the long term, improving human rights in North Korean society is an essential part of that process because currently the international community tends to limit trade in goods based on forced labor and oppression. So even if North Korea achieves denuclearization, its economic development will be limited if it does not pursue respect for human rights in the subsequent economic process. So it is therefore necessary for North Korea regime to prepare for reform and opening by pursuing human rights improvements on its own. It's hard to expect, but uh, logically uh, it is true. So gradually improving human rights and establishing a economic and political foundation that meets international standards will be beneficial to North Korea's development in the long run. So we have to develop a logic for pursuing denuclearization and human rights improvements simultaneously while explicitly recognizing the connection between the two. But lastly, in the long run, improving human rights in North Korea is crucial to peace between two Koreas and to laying the groundwork for reunification. As North Korea's region becomes more different from South Korea, the prospect for reunification are deemed uh, now and the cost of political reunification increase. So it is imperative to recognize that improving human rights in North Korea is necessary for the regime's long-term survival and the future of reunification. Thank you. Thank you, doc, uh, Dr. Chun. Um, so I would like to go back to our earlier question, discussions. Um, some of you touched on the uh, China. So I'd like to go back to Dr. Chong Park and Mr. Snyder about, and ask you about China. We always talk about China, China's role on North Korea, given its um, enormous leverage and trade relationship. But right now, China and, and also Russia do not cooperate on North Korea. There's a divided UN Security Council. And a lot of like, uh, what we saw recently at the UN Security, what happened at the UN Security Council make us some of us sort of like think that maybe we should lower our expectation about China's role in North Korea, including human rights. So I wonder whether you kind of agree with that or do you th still think that there's room for us to engage China on North Korea issues? I think we engage regardless of whether expectations are low or not, um, because I think um, it's important to put that on the record. Um, we have raised DPRK issues um, from the president on down um, with, the, with the PRC. Um, and so that's a regular uh, point of conversation in, um, in exchanges with uh, Chinese interlocutors. Um, and of course, at, in New York, our ambassador, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, also engages with the with the PRC in New York to talk about uh, human rights issues. Um, Beijing absolutely has influence uh, in the DPRK. Um, I, you know, it wasn't so long ago that, that North Korea had a, a, a whole list of countries that they did economic um, or had economic relationships with. Um, but in recent years, the China has accounts for you know, over 95%, I think, um, last I saw, of, of trade with the DPRK. So there's been a puckering up of, of North Korea's economic relations with, with China. Um, you know, we, and we continue to um, press um, Beijing to 
uh, to shut down procurement networks in, in China, to uh, repatriate North Korean workers um, consistent with international uh, law, labor and, and refugee laws, um, and to uh, constrain uh, the DPRK from conducting its provocative actions. And that doesn't mean that we have high expectations that Beijing will do so because the observables of PRC activities is its continuous shielding of DPRK, even in, the, in, in, uh, in, its, uh, in DPRK's ICBM test, for example, shielding the DPRK along with Russia um, from any it, repercussions um, from, from North Korea's provocative actions. So we continue to have those conversations with the PRC whenever and wherever we can. On the human rights issue specifically, um, of course, you know, we are concerned about forced repatriation. PRC considers um, uh, North Korean laborers or, uh, in, in, in China as uh, economic migrants, um, and so they, they can be forcibly repatriated, uh, which, were, and which makes the North Koreans who are returned more, very vulnerable to torture, uh, forced abortions, or even death. Um, and we are also concerned about reports that there are potentially hundreds of North Koreans that are, have been detained in, in, in China, and that if, forcibly, or if, if, they, if they're returned to the DPRK, that um, when the border opens, um, that they will be subject to that kind of violence. Um, and we regularly uh, raise these issues with the PRC um, and call on Beijing to uphold its obligations under her uh, under a, a variety of UN um, conventions and, um, and uh, obligations. So uh, let me stop there for now. Thank you. Um, I think it's very clear that the conditions of geopolitical rivalry uh, make it a lot harder for the US to be able to have influence on China. Um, and actually what has been very interesting to me about the UN debate uh, has been uh, that under those conditions, it does put China into the position of having to defend North Korea to some degree, and that means endorsing North Korean exceptionalism, which I think is the key to understanding North Korea's strategy and aims as related to the international community on both the North Korean and the human rights front. And so what that suggests to me is that China is taking on this risk, but also needs to be pressed in very clear terms to own that risk. Uh, and I think that it's incumbent upon us to spell out even more clearly than we have uh, that in defending North Korea, China is taking the step to endorse an exceptionalist state in North Korea that is seeking to use the international community to undergird its legitimation. Uh, and we really cannot stand for that. Uh, and so I think that that is what is at stake. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, the implications of the geopolitical rivalry are making it more difficult for us to be able to move forward. Uh, you know, China is a player. Um, I think the ch more challenging policy question ends up being, okay, do you subordinate North Korea policy to China policy? And what would be the impact in terms of being able to make progress on North Korea? Um, can we really force China to own the North Korea issue when they, they have, I don't know, I feel like they have partial ownership or a leaseholdership, but they don't have full control. Uh, and yet figuring out how to make them own it in a way that actually will generate a more positive outcome, I think, has proven to be a nut that we haven't cracked yet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So, um, so Ambassador Joseph and I mean Professor Chong, if you can speak, feel free to say it. But if not, then don't worry. <coughs> Ambassador Joseph. So some people argue that you know many people actually argue that actually believe that North Korea is not going to give up nuclear weapons. So some people actually start to argue that maybe U.S. and South Korea start to think about arms control negotiation with North Korea. Um, <coughs> So I'd like to ask your thought on that, and my, do you agree with that? And also, can arms control be the first step towards denuclearization? That's well, my second before, question. Before I come to that yeah. stupid idea, let me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can be provocative and I can be offensive apparently, but let me say a couple of things. 
Uh, first about China. Uh, I'll never forget a trip that I took to China with Dr. Rice right after the first nuclear test. This was a huge issue, okay? Mm -hmm. Much more so than the second test and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. This was a big issue. And we went to Tokyo, we went to Seoul, and then we went to, uh, to Beijing. And the Chinese at that point were, I would say, more than disturbed about the fact that North Korea had tested when they had asked them not to test. They felt disrespected. And it's at this point where they join in a UN Security Council resolution, which for the first time had effective sanctions placed on, on North Korea. Those days are over in my view. Mm. Okay. I think that it, it has moved from that situation to if not formal allies, they are at least de facto allies. And I think when you think about North Korea and you think about risks, you've got to take it in the, con the broader context of Taiwan and, 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 and a China relationship more generally. Second, I think a lot of the discussion today it's just, we're just whistling past the graveyard, okay? Uh, we need, we, my view, okay, we need to recognize that human rights and the nuclear issue will not be resolved until this regime is ended. And we can talk about, you know, logical things and we can, we, we, we can talk about that, but I don't think it's logical to expect them to give in on either one of those topics, on, on nuclear issues and, the, and everything they say and everything they do suggests that they're only going to get more and become more and more of a threat. Okay? And what do we do? They test a, a solid engine uh, ICBM last week, or at least that's what was reported. And what does our government respond? Well, this is a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, and we want them to come back to negotiations. Okay, I mean, uh, we need an alternative. We need a paradigm shift in how we think about this threat. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, to get bureaucracies to think differently and to act differently. And until we have a president who comes into office committed committed to a fundamentally different strategy toward North Korea. We're going to continue to see the deterioration of human rights inside North Korea and a greater and greater repression of the people. And we're going to continue to see the growth in the nuclear and missile threat to the United States, to our, to our forces in the region, and to our friends and allies in the region. There's just no, there's just no question, okay? I mean, talk about logic. Uh, 30 years, 30 years of failure, enough of failure already, okay? Let's try something else. But there isn't an al another alternative that's out there as far as I can tell, okay? So, uh, you know, we, we need fundamental change that will only come about through new leadership. I see this very, in, a, in a very similar way as I saw, you know, the, the, ridding ourselves of the ADM <coughs> which for 30 years had dominated U.S. strategic posture and forces and policy. 30 years, we said, we can't defend ourselves against ballistic missile attack because that would start an arms control. Never mind that the facts were exactly opposite to that. After the ABM treaty goes into effect, we have, we have the largest offensive arms race. Once, once we get withdrawn, what does Putin say? And interestingly, his, st his statement is still on the Kremlin website. He says, this is not a threat to Russia. And oh, by the way, we're going to continue large-scale offensive reductions. But the facts didn't matter in the debate. They, don't, they didn't matter. It was just, you know, it's, it, it's just impolite, it seems, to talk about regime change, to use those two loaded words, regime change. But we have to get over that if, you know, if, and, and again, it's from within. This is not Iraq. This, this is about patience and strength over time to deal, with, to deal with regime and to see the end of this regime. Now getting to this idea, this idea about you know, recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapon state and having, and having arms control negotiations with them. Why would anyone think that it would bring a different result? Why, why, why would you think that? There's absolutely no evidence to suggest that that would be the case. And all you're doing is legitimizing a country that has 
previously signed the NPT and you're opening yourself up for other countries to take the same path. Now you can say, well, India, Pakistan, and, and, and Israel, but they didn't sign. North Korea signed the NPT. And I think if you want to undercut the NPT, that's the way, that's the way you do it. Thank you. Um, so I think that um, your argument on the North Korean human rights and the denuclearization issue is sort of on the same page. Um, I think North Korea basically used these tools to ensure the regime survival. I think that sort of uh, correlates with the, what uh, Ambassador Lee actually, oh, Lee jong mentioned it uh, at the beginning. So, um, so, so it's time for the, there's a, we need to demonstrate political will to do something different, I guess. So uh, going back to uh, Dr. Sheen Agritton about your uh, research on the diaspora. Um, I guess that maybe, do you suggest anything, uh, anything that this, this diaspora can play a role to promote a North Korean human rights or raising a human rights issues both within or outside North Korea? Yeah, um, I have a couple of thoughts on that. If I can make one comment about the China question oh, sure. and the relationship between China and, and Korea policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, this is a really interesting question about should Korea policy be subordinated to China policy? Mm -hmm. Um, and I understand why we've, you know, we ask about it and we frame it that way. Honestly, in looking at the sort of tectonic shifts that seem to be occurring in the world, both the U.S.-China rivalry, the war in Ukraine, Russia's um, behavior, and the the Russia-China relationship, um, and then I look at, at statements like the one that Xi Jinping made uh, toward toward uh, Kim Jong Un in the past week or so, um, and I'm not sure U.S. policymakers are going to have a choice on that. Um, so I think that uh, strategic planning and strategic thinking in the U.S. Uh, sort of policy community and the Korea policy community needs to confront the reality that whether we like it or not, uh, China may make a choice to subordinate Korea policy in ways that, that the United States does not have full control over. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, 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 um, it would probably be wise to spend a little bit of time thinking through what the implications of that are if Korea policy ends up um, moving in that direction, not because we choose it, um, but because other actors in the region choose it. Mm -hmm. um, so that said, let me, um, uh, I think this question, uh, thank you for asking ab about the, the question of the, the role of the North Korean diaspora. I think it's um, uh, really uh, um, positive to see some of the steps that the UN government has taken with respect to North Korean human rights, both the reporting and cataloging of human rights abuses and the fact that those are now publicly documented, I think is, is very helpful. Um, and I think that um, that Ambassador Lee's work is, is really critically important because it, it reflects um, the understanding that of the, the global nature of, of the North Korean human rights issue. Um, and we all know, I think, from, from reading and following the work of the Commission of Inquiry, um, that uh, the North Korean refugees and defectors, North, members of the North Korean diaspora were essential to the work of the, the Commission of Inquiry and have continued to be essential to, to the North Korean human rights efforts that the international community has engaged in. Um, but in, in some ways at the time that the Commission of Inquiry was established, members of the diaspora and members of the defector and refugee community actually went around the ROK government. Um, to, to find opportunities for voice and influence um, rather than, than being fully empowered and, and cooperative with it. Um, and the, if you think about the, the role of the, um, of the North Korean diaspora, um, as with respect to the Commission of Inquiry, the primary role was that of a witness, right? Of that as a, a witness to the atrocities and the systemic, sustained human rights abuses that had taken place inside the, the DK, DPRK. But I think as we look forward and we talk about implementation and action, there are two other way, roles that we could think about about the North Korean diaspora um, taking on. Um, the first is as a representative, right, um, with the ability to continue to speak for the people of North Korea in forums where the people themselves do not have a voice. Um, so not just witnessing what has happened in the past, but actively representing in the present. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third role is one as a stakeholder in the future. Um, and, uh, and particularly in a democratic future. 
So again, with, with some, uh, during the time that I was, I was at CSIS as an adjunct fellow, I, I worked on a book project on the North Korean diaspora. And we did uh, some survey work um, among members of the North Korean diaspora here in the United States, as well as, as kind of comparing that to some of the survey data that, that exists in South Korea. One of the things that's quite striking is just how strongly North Korean refugees and defectors have internalized the norms of democratic citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually came through very pretty, pretty strikingly in the, the survey results um, when, we, when we asked people about um, how they thought about different aspects of, of democratic citizenship. Mm -hmm. um, and so that ability to be active stakeholders with experience in democratic politics and, and um, to have a stake in the democratic future of North Korea, I think, is, is really critically um, important. I think it's also important to recognize that the transnational nature of that pro-democratic, pro-human rights diasporic community mm. has been critical to uh, some of the successes that, that North Korean human rights advocacy has had. Mm. Um, the COI uh, and some of the advocacy work has been critical because there is a, a sizable community in South Korea where there's a critical mass of voices and, and, and actors. Um, but part of the reason why the advocacy work has been effective has also been due to the presence of anchor communities in the US, in the UK, elsewhere in Europe, in Japan, and, and in, uh, in other parts of the world that helped catalyze global pressure um, mm -hmm. and to, to internationalize the issue beyond the, the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been a tendency for reasons that many of us know and understand and that make a lot of sense, frankly, um, to see onward migration of, the, of North Korean refugees and defectors outside the Korean Peninsula solely through the lens of policy failure um, by either the Ministry of Unification or resettlement policy in, in South Korea. And there's certainly been some of that. And I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat, um, sugarcoat that in any way. Um, but I also think, again, if we think about how do we take where we are and look at it moving forward, um, the transnational nature of, of the North Korean um, community, um, ha it can be a real strategic and an advocacy asset um, because it enables a, tr a different kind of, of global cooperation um, than would exist if that community was solely concentrated on the Korean Peninsula or, or in, in South Korea. Um, and so I think, again, um, looking at how do we think about these roles, not just as witnesses of the past, but as representatives in the present and stakeholders in the future, how do we combine that with the idea of this transnational community as an, an asset, mm. um, not a, a, a sort of uh, solely a re reason to criticize the South Korean government policy? Um, I think that that's a, a good starting place. Um, for thinking about what the role of, of North Koreans around the world can be in shaping the, the eventual future of their, of their homeland. Yeah. And so again, I'll stop there and see if people have follow-up questions. Yeah. Sounds, I think I re really agree with you. So uh, my final question is before we have uh, going into a Q&A session, maybe now we are expecting a South Korean president coming to town, so maybe we should sort of shift to that direction and then maybe I will just briefly ask all of you just ask a question about this. So both Biden and UN governments are aligned in many things, especially both governments' emphasis on freedom, democracy, international norms, and rule of law, and human rights. So I wonder whether this alignment can provide unique momentum to empower North Korea's human rights agenda, uh, both not just in the US and uh, South Korea, but as well as the international community. So any thoughts or you know, comments would be great. Uh, we're really excited about uh, President Yoon's visit, um, and, I, and I think in terms of alignment, I think you know having Ambassador Lee Shin Hua be the human rights envoy from from the Republic of Korea, and our and hopefully Julie Turner mm -hmm. um, getting confirmed quickly. Um, I think that provides a lot of um, momentum um, mm -hmm. in the coming months and years um, in terms of human rights efforts. Um, and as Scott has mentioned earlier, to continuing that discourse mm -hmm. on human rights and, and affecting change that way. Yeah. I, I certainly agree. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, Yoon is a breath of fresh air, mm -hmm. a stark difference from his predecessor in the context of human rights, in the context of U.S.-South Korean relations and in the context of our, our presence, uh, in, including with Japan and other allies uh, in the region. 
I, I hope and I think that they will uh, have a powerful statement on human rights, uh, but it's going to fall on deaf ears again uh, if what you're trying, if who you're trying to convince is either uh, Beijing uh, or Pyongyang. I really think that that depends on how President Yoon wants to use some of the speeches that he's going to give next week. Mm. Uh, he will have a chance at a joint session of Congress to highlight this issue. Mm. He'll be giving other speeches. Um, and of course, people will focus on um, what President Yoon and President Biden say together. But, you know, that will be driven, I think, in part by what kinds of questions they get. So it's hard for me to predict. Mm whether anything substantive on this issue would come out. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's certainly an important opportunity. Um, I, you know, I'm not based here and don't know exactly what the, the anticipation or, or, or expectation is about, about his visit. I certainly see it as an opportunity to place North Korean human rights in context and to outline a vision for what the United States and South Korea together could do um, on these issues in a rapidly changing uh, international environment where this is a really important issue and there are a lot of, of other things that shape the U.S.-South Korea relationship and alliance um, that also have to be discussed and, and talked about. Um, and so I think it's, it's, um, it'll be a really important opportunity to sort of crystallize um, mm -hmm. what a vision is moving forward. But again, I think a lot of it does depend on um, the speeches next yeah. week, and it kind of, I, I think all of us will be looking to those to understand how these two issues, the security and, and human rights issues, are linked in the international environment as it's evolved. Yeah. Can you speak? <laughs> yes, I think there will be uh, three main areas of discussion between two presidents. First one is uh, extended deterrence mm. because of the rising threats from North Korea. The second will be economic security issues uh, coming from the IRA, all those things. The third one will be more abstract, which will be value-based diplomacy, which will include uh, the tenet of global pivotal state and also human rights issues. Uh, but I think uh, if we have a very robust foundation of extended deterrence, then we can have uh, the leverage to talk about human rights issues because in South Korea there is some demand that uh, there should be uh, inter-Korean dialogue or development of inter-Korean relations uh, but if we stick to the idea of extended deterrence and very uh, hard position vis-a-vis -vis North Korea then uh, the opposing side will criticize that but if we have a very clear idea of extended deterrence, then we don't need to appease North Korea anymore. Then uh, on the basis of that, we can talk about uh, human rights issues. Related to that, in South Korea, there is a lot of concerns uh, of US proposals of uh, arms control, as you said. Uh, because in, in South Korea also, there is growing skepticism about complete denuclearization of North Korea. So some commentators in the United States say that uh, we have to pursue the alternative method of arms control. But as far as, far as I read, uh, the arms control approach doesn't exclude uh, the prospect of denuclearization as the ultimate goal. Uh, we can just uh, focus on the risk reduction and uh, you know how to prevent North Korea from uh, upgrading their missile capabilities or increasing their nuclear warheads. Uh, so there might be some, uh, you know, commonplace between these two alternatives. So I think there should be some more intense di uh, dialogue between South Korea and North, uh, United States about the prospect of denuclearization. Thank you. So with that, I would like to start open the floor for Q&A. Um, so Ms. So from RFA. Oh, please identify yourself. Sorry, I said it. <laughs> sure. Hi, my name is Hejun So from Radio Free Asia. Um, uh, this is kind of going off of the last question that you guys already discussed, but uh, we see President Yoon and President Biden meeting next week. 
But do you think there's a chance for them to discuss about the human rights situation where we see inevitably the situation turning the whole um, discussion into the nuclear threats that North Korea is um, constantly posing? Um, and also, if they do, what do you expect them to discuss in terms of taking more practical actions going forward? Thank you. Who, you are, uh, who, who are you directing your question to? Panelist. <laughs> uh, one one thing that I learned um, when when I re-entered government is that you never um, speak before your president. <laughs> um, so, but but you know, in terms of DPRK issues, I mean, I think we've been pretty consistent about talking uh, about about these issues at all levels of the U.S. government. Well, my question is directed to the Joseph that is a very interesting uh, remark you made. Uh, you said uh, the issue of North Korean human rights and the nuclear issue has been situated in different silo. Uh, but you said uh, if Reagan administration, in particular President Reagan, was that successful to putting human rights is one of the four main issues, and then in a couple of years, the Soviet Union became history. Why the succeeding uh, administration didn't learn lessons to placing human rights issue is one of the important foreign policy goals toward any countries who have a problem of human rights violations. And the quick thing for Jung Park, uh, if Julie Turner is uh, approved, I understand uh, she's going to working with you in your bureau instead of a DRL. That means the human rights issue will be equally like, uh, treated or considered with uh, nuclearization or military issues when you're dealing with North Korea. I'll answer that first. Please. Um, the you know I, the the specific details of how that's going to work out is still you know we're still talking about that. But um, she and I work pretty closely together already. Um, you know she's she's currently at the works on these issues at the State Department and her and she's been doing it for you know over twenty years. So um, I expect that relationship to continue. I think that the administrations that have followed Reagan have all been very consistent in stating that human rights is an important element of U.S. national security. If you go back and read the national security strategy documents from each administration, you'll see that statement over and over again. It's just that the silos continued. And it can, I, I believe they continue to, to this day. Uh, why is that? Well, I think that is because of the way bureaucracies think and the way bureaucracies act, even in an interagency sort of context. Uh, there are other priorities that are established. But I think fundamentally it's a lack of leadership by Republican and Democratic presidents alike. And it's not just our, you know, our uh, shortcoming. The same, the same is true in, in, in your country, okay? I mentioned this trip in, in, in 2006 after the first test. Our stop in Seoul was a total disaster, okay? I mean, you had, you had your president talking about, well, I have to balance the problems I have with the United States with those of China. I mean, this, this is just after the North Korean nuclear test. That's what the trip was all about. And he was not a promoter of human rights. And, in, you know, and, and, and if, if we can't partner with South Korea in a meaningful way on human rights in North Korea, we're, we're not going to make very much progress. But I think the, the real answer is lack of leadership. And I don't, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry there'll be, there'll be, as I said, strong statements on human rights, the importance of human rights, but I think they're going to fall on deaf ears. They're not going to have an effect. And I think the nuclear issue will be front and center. And I could write the talking points right now, okay, 
It's North Korea ought to denuclearize. We're ready for negotiations anytime, anywhere, any place. Okay? This, is, this is not brain surgery. This is real easy because we've seen the same statement over and over and over again well before the, the Biden administration even came into office. It hasn't changed. And the, the, you know, the, the real tragedy in this is that the human rights community has the experience and has the knowledge that can help as a key element of a strategy to bring an end to the regime and to free the North Korean people and to eliminate the nuclear threat. And that's why we have to bring them, that, that's why we have to bring them together with the national security community. Uh, but it's gonna take leadership at the top in my country. It's gonna take a, a new president uh, and it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not sort of President Trump because he'll go back and do the same thing he did before. I mean, that's his action. He, he doubles down on stuff. Uh, and it's not going to be President Biden, uh, who has shown really very little interest, quite frankly, in, uh, in, in North Korea. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's going to take, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, it's going to take somebody who comes into the White House, appoints the right people at the right level, and holds them accountable for getting the job done. Dr. Cha. Um, so, just, so just following up on that, so this is for Bob, just following up on that, so I guess there are two questions. The first is, is is the only way to to get to a strategy like this that really sort of busts all the silos and um, and has this sort of top-down approach is perhaps the only way to get to that sort of strategy is for the United States actually to say we give up on denuclearization. I mean, we you know we say our policy is denuclearization, but Perhaps the only way to get to an alternative strategy is actually to give up on the first strategy. Now, if when we talk about giving up on the first strategy, right now the default in Washington is to say arms control. But is it really to say, you know, when North Korea in 2027 has as many nuclear weapons as France, at that point, does the consensus finally become, we've just given up on this and we need a whole new approach and that's where we end up at this idea of a human rights up front. So that's the first question. And the second is, who do you envision as sort of the allies, the allies behind this approach? Like who else do you think would go along with this sort of, of, of approach? I think it's pretty safe to say China will not, right? But, but who do you think are some of the possible countries that would go along with an, with an idea like this? Uh, certainly, I am not advocating giving up on denuclearization. I think denuclearization has to be one of our principal objectives. What I'm talking about is a different and effective way of getting to that objective. Okay? No, we can't give up on denuclearization. Denuclearization is critically important for our security, for the security of South Korea, for the security of the region. It's just that if, you know, what we've done to achieve that goal hasn't worked. 30 years of consistent failure. I mean, the policy's been consistent, okay? But the failure has also been consistent. And you, you use the, the term strategy in terms of our current strategy. I don't think we have a strategy. We, we have a policy, and we have a strategic objective in terms of denuclearization. But where's the strategy? What we need is a strategy, is a comprehensive strategy, if, if we're going to achieve that goal. Uh, and in terms of, what's the second one? Uh, who else would support? Well, you're right, China would not support, Russia would not support, other rogue na nations would not support. Uh, but I would hope that through diplomacy, which, which I think is a very key component of any strategy, uh, through diplomacy, we would be able to get more and more support from the European Union, from European countries who have been who have stood up for human rights. Uh, but but also, I, it, it, I mean, it, it becomes very very complicated, as you know better than I, Victor. You're a lot smarter than I am on these issues. But I mean, think about sort of Japan under the right conditions, uh, Australia under the right conditions. I mean. All of these countries, and including our own, we have to balance risk, right? 
Okay, because we risk certain, certain key things with China, for example, if we, if we pursue this. But what's the risk if we don't? What's the risk if, we can, if we're content with continued failure in terms of denuclearization as their nuclear program moves forward, as their human rights, uh, as, as their brutality of, their, of the North Korean people move forward? What's, where's the alternative here? And it's certainly not in the talking point that, you know, we stand ready to negotiate anywhere, anytime, anyplace. I'm just tired of hearing that pablum. Uh, Roberta, uh, mics, please. Thank you. Um, I just wondered when you refer constantly to regime change and uh, would like to see all kinds of discussions and, and promotion of regime change, um, if, if you look at the uh, North Korea situation, I mean, it's a country I don't believe that's had one day of democracy in its history. Um, are you envisaging a kind of turmoil there? Are you, do you assume that the population would support? I just wondered what would go on there uh, that would look, that would follow after the first idea of regime change. And I'm not taking a position one way or the other. Uh, but I think one has to know where one is going and making regime change. Um, secondly, uh, China may be against it, but I don't think that's the issue. They're right on the border, and I don't think they would tolerate any kind of turmoil on their border, or that's what they say. Um, I think that would be quite, it wouldn't just be a position they would have, it would be an actual involvement they would have. Um, and I wonder how much thought is being given to that. Uh, the other thing is that the term regime change, I don't think it's a very um, a catchy one given that the U.S. has been engaged in uh, regime change in some places and I think there'd be a lot of arguments about those, those cases. I, I think we think of Iraq or Libya or even Afghanistan or, and there are other places. Um, I don't know what we got and um, whether you consider that a, a great improvement. And I am not hardly not wanting to maintain, I don't think I know anybody I've ever heard that would like to see Kim Jong-un remain where he is. Um, there's, there's that, and I think it's a very big subject, that, and the words create a lot of um, memory and also expectation on what we're talking about. Uh, so I wonder how much attention has been paid to that. Um, and I do want to say that even before the Reagan administration, there was an administration that I was involved with that did look both at the arms control and denuclearization with the Soviet Union, um, as well as promoting human rights, but did not speak of regime change. Well, regime change is a very impolite word or, or phrase. Whenever I say regime change, I say regime change from within. Okay. This is not about Iraq. And there's nobody that has more scars on their back associated with Iraq than I do. Okay, Because I was the WMD guy. Okay, uh, And what we did with Libya, you mentioned Libya, what we did with Libya in 2003, at the time that we're going into Iraq and defeating the Iraqi army and everything looks good, we got denuclearization. And it was real denuclearization through secret negotiations, which I had, I had the you know, privilege of leading. We sent a large ship over. We brought hundreds of metric tons of their nuclear program, as well as the long-range missiles, back to the United States. That was a different model. When you think about sort of the Iraq model, you go to war for denuclearization. Libya. You avoid that. And that was President Bush's, Bush 43, that was his vision. You set up an alternative model. And I think we need to think about alternative models. The strategy that, uh, that you know, we're proposing in, 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 you know, is, is one in which we're, we're looking for an alternative way to achieve the objectives that we have failed to achieve for 30 years, okay? Uh, you know, I think, I think more, you know, more, uh, uh, more sort of 
more relevant than Iraq as a model. I think you need to think about the Soviet Union. Here you had an enemy, ideologically opposed, uh, for 60 years, with not two or four or 40 or 60 or 200, but with thousands of missiles pointed at us. And our policy was containment. And containment is, is, is a policy. Containment became a strategy. And the objective was the end of the Soviet Union. That was the objective. And there was a recognition, at least in the Reagan uh, administration, that that's how you could, that's how, that's the only means that you could solve the nuclear threat and the only means that you could uh, see the, you know, the, the freeing of the, of, of the Soviet peoples. And I think that's more sort of the, the, the model that you have to think about uh, with, uh, with, with North Korea. It's not going to be easy, as I said. There's no silver bullet. It's not going to be, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not going to happen without sort of, without uh, difficulty, without risks. Uh, and I would think that, you know, as you think about sort of the unraveling of the regime, there are a hundred different scenarios that you could postulate. Uh, and we need to be prepared for as many of those as we can. And we need to, I think more importantly, being prepared for those and being reactive, we need to be able to do what we can, it may be limited, but do what we can to help shape that future, bringing all of the tools of statecraft, including diplomacy, including you know, uh, managing, I will use that term, our relationship with China. I mean, you raise a very important point. What's the Chinese reaction going to be? Okay, because we know they're adamantly opposed to a Korea that's unified and that is allied with the United States. Okay, so what, you know, how, 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 do we, how do we navigate that? And we need to think about that as we, as, as we move into this, into this different environment. But the alternative, as you, you, you may or may not agree, but the alternative is that we continue to see a growth in the nuclear threat and you know, even greater repression of the North Korean people. I mean, if that's the alternative you're willing to accept, well, you accept that. Uh, but the risk there is, is, is one that is tremendous, as I've said. We already reached uh, more than we are, um, the amount of time that we are allowed for this conference. So uh, I guess that we really had a very constructive discussion today, uh, although the international environment is very much more difficult than compared to 10 years ago, but I think we really were able to touch upon some of the uh, actions that we could maybe consider up to date, um, consider, uh, and then be able to implement in the future. So I hope that this con uh, conversation we can, hopefully we can continue in the future. With that, I would like to conclude the second panel. Thank you very much.